Ads heard during the podcast that are not in my voice are placed by third-party agencies outside of my control and should not imply an endorsement by Weird Darkness or myself. Stories and content in Weird Darkness can be disturbing for some listeners and is intended for mature audiences only. Parental discretion is strongly advised. It's common practice to reserve a plot next to your loved one's grave in anticipation of your own death. But Jonathan Reed took it one step further. The retired merchant was devastated when his beloved wife, Mary E. Gould Reed, died in 1893. After Mary's internment in her father's family vault on March 19th of that year, Jonathan visited regularly, a little too often in the opinion of his father-in-law. When Mary's father died in 1895, Reed was free to visit her tomb to his heart's content. So he had her casket transferred to another vault in the Whispering Grove section of the cemetery. There he put an empty casket next to hers, a placeholder for his inevitable end. And it is here that Jonathan Reed's tale takes a surprising twist. Unable to bear being away from his wife's corpse, Jonathan moved in to Mary's mausoleum. He brought furniture and a wood stove and cheered up the place with mementos from Mary's life, her paintings, her unfinished knitting, and the family's pet parrot, which, upon the death of the bird, was stuffed. Jonathan even took his meals inside the crypt. As news of the devoted widower spread, visitors came by to catch a glimpse of the man who now made his home living amongst the dead. Nearly 7,000 people reportedly wandered through Evergreen's cemetery for the sole purpose of encountering Jonathan Reed. The New York Times even covered the story, explaining helpfully, Mr. Reed could never be made to believe that his wife was really dead, his explanation of her condition being that the warmth had simply left her body and that if he kept the mausoleum warm, she would continue to sleep peacefully in the costly metallic casket in which her remains were put. According to witnesses, he carried on long conversations with his wife. The Times reported that he really believed that his wife could understand what he was saying to her. For nearly ten years, Jonathan made his happy home in Mary's tomb. Then in May 1905, caretakers discovered his still body on the crypt's floor, his arms outstretched to the casket of his dearly departed wife. Jonathan Reed was interred next to Mary in his prepared casket. The doors to the vault were sealed, and the doors remain locked to this day. I'm Darren Marlar. Welcome to Weird Darkness. The Black Museum. Its affiliated stations present Escape. Welcome, Weirdos! I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness Retro Radio. Here you'll find stories of the paranormal, supernatural, legends, lore, the strange and bizarre, crime, conspiracy, mysterious, macabre, unsolved, and unexplained. And in between the stories, I bring you some of the best dark, creepy, and horrifying old-time radio shows from what I've collected over the years. If you're new here, welcome to the show! While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, sign up for my free newsletter, connect with me on social media, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated. Plus, you can visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Now, bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into the weird darkness.
The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I am E.G. Marshall. Welcome to the sound of suspense... Welcome to the fear you can hear, but mostly to the world of terrifying imagination. In the story you are about to hear, the heroine is a young woman of 77 who has reached her golden years with her sense of independence intact, with a spryness to her limbs, very good vision, and excellent hearing. But as you are about to learn... There are times when hearing well is not a blessing. I did it, Mrs. Canby. Are you listening to me? I killed Richardson. No. I did it. Me. No, no, no. I don't want to hear it, Mr. Paulson. Please, please don't tell me about it. Please. <laughs> mystery drama, The Old Ones Are Hard to Kill, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Henry Slesser and stars Agnes Moorhead. It is sponsored in part by Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser, and by the Kellogg Company, makers of Kellogg's Special K cereal. I'll return shortly with Act One. Now, here's Act One of The Old Ones Are Hard to Kill. It begins with a stethoscope, a blood pressure reading, an electrocardiogram, and an altogether satisfying report on the health of Mrs. Ada Canby. Hmm. Well, can't see a thing to complain about, Ada. That little congestion you had last time is all cleared up. All in all, I'd say you're doing fine. For a woman my age, you mean. (laughs) (laughs) The older the chicken, the tougher it is to kill. (laughs) That's what my grandmother used to tell me, and she lived to be 98. Mm -hmm. Speaking of relatives, you uh, see much of Walter. My grandson? Oh, the usual once-a-year visit, and he always comes up with the same complaint. What's that? That I shouldn't be living all alone. Yeah, that big house of yours must get pretty lonely sometimes. Well, the truth is, Dr. George, I'm not alone there. Mm, you're not? I decided to take you in the border last month. Really? I haven't written Walter about it. Uh, I'm sure he'd object to my taking in a stranger, but there's really nothing wrong with Mr. Paulson, except his health, maybe. His uh, health? What's wrong with him? Oh, the poor man's had a terrible cold for the past two weeks. Well, let me do a thing for him, though. Well, now, where did you meet this Mr. Paulson? Well, he answered the ad I ran. He's just back from South America. Been living in Brazil for years. He's a very nice gentleman, really. He keeps himself and tends his birds. He has the loveliest blue parakeets. You can hear them chirping all over the house. Oh, it's the friendliest sound. Well, I, uh... I don't see anything wrong with what you're doing, Ada. Just make sure you don't go and catch the man's cold. Well, there's not much chance of that. Poor man hardly ever leaves his room. Well, how much do I owe you? I'll send you the bill. I'm sure you'll forget all about it. <laughs> <laughs> Promise me you'll send it. Um... Dear. Mr. Paulson? Are you all right? Yes, Mrs. Canby. I'm all right. That cough sounds worse than ever to me. Why don't you let me fix you a little hot milk and honey? No, thank you, Mrs. Canby. Thanks very much. I'm going to try to get some sleep. Well, all right, if you say so. I guess it's time I was in bed myself. Oh, my, listen to that. 
that poor man. I wonder if he keeps his birds awake, too. Mrs. Canby, please, please. For heaven's sake, is he, is he calling me? Mrs. Canby. He is calling me. I'm, I'm coming, Mr. Paulson. Oh, no. Where are those darn slippers? I'll be right there. What, what is it, Mr. Paulson? What's the matter? Mrs. Canby. Mr. Paulson. Just look at you. Why didn't you tell me you were so sick? I would have called a doctor. No, no, too late now. Too late. I, I know a very good doctor. I saw him only this afternoon. I, I'll go and call him right no, now. No, please, listen to me. Well, I've got to get help for you, Mr. Paulson. I'm dying. I'm dying. Confession. Well, it, it, do, do you want a priest? Is, is that what you want? Richardson murdered. Ten years ago. What? Murder. I did it. I killed him for money. I was paid. Did you hear me? Oh, Lord. Uh, Mr. Paulson, do you know what you're saying? Do you understand me? Lindell is innocent. I killed Richardson, oh. not Lindell. Well, let, let me get help. Uh, and you can tell them yourself, Mr. Paulson, and the police and the doctor. You tell them, please. Tell them to free Lindell. He's innocent. Tell them I'm the one who killed Richardson ten years ago. Oh, I don't know anything about such things, and I don't want to. I did it. I killed Richardson. I, I did no, it. I don't, I don't want to hear it. I don't, please don't tell me. <laughs> Mr. Paulson, I, I... Mr. Paulson... Oh, dear God, I, I think he's gone. <laughs> Listen to those poor little birdies. I suppose they miss poor Mr. Paulson. I'll lay them in his room. Well, let's see about this letter now. Dear Walter, I hope you don't mind my turning to you for advice, but I really don't know what to do. It's been three days since my boarder, Mr. Paulson, passed away, and I still haven't told the police what the man said to me. I just can't bring myself to get mixed up in anything like this. Uh, dear, what's the use of writing, Walter? He'll probably think I've dreamed it all up. No, I'll just forget it. How do you forget such a thing? Those names, I keep hearing them. Richardson, Lindell. Lindell is innocent. Oh, dear God, what if it's all true? If Mr. Paulson actually murdered this Richardson and Lindell is innocent, only, well, who are they? I wonder if a telephone book, well, well why not? Let's see. Richardson. Richard. Oh, I see there, J.R. Yes, yes, here it is. Oh, Lord, there's dozens of them. Well, I'll try Lindell. That wouldn't be as common, I don't suppose. Yes, yes, here it is. There's only about half a dozen, then. D-L-D-E-L-L-L. Oh. Oh, my heavens. Lindell and Richardson. Both names together. Lindell and Richardson. Investments. Nine concourse four one five three one three two. I wonder if well maybe maybe it's the only way to be sure. Mr. Lindell? He isn't? Well, then what about Mr. Richardson? Oh, I see. Well, is there someone there I can speak to? Yes, yes, please. Thank you. Hello. This is Mr. Chelton. May I be of service? Well, maybe you can. I, I want to know about your Mr. Richardson, uh, about when he died. I think I did business with him once, uh, a long time ago. Well, it's ten years, madam, just about. But uh, if you're interested in investment advice... Well, I'll think about it. Thank you very much. 
Ten years. Well, it could be a coincidence. I guess it all depends on how he died. Well, Mrs. Canby, please come in. Have a seat. Thank you. Well, now, how can we be of help to you? I didn't come here to get help, Mr. Shelton. I came to help you, as a matter of fact. Or rather, somebody you know. Who would that be? Uh, Mr. John Lindell, the man who was supposed to have murdered Mr. Richardson. I'm afraid I'm not following you. Well, it took me all week to find out what happened to those two men. And finally, I found the story in the old newspaper room down at the library about Mr. Lindell being indicted for killing his partner. But I'm, I'm sure you know the whole story a lot better than I do. Well, of course I know the story, but <laughs> that was quite a long time ago, Mrs. Canby. Ten years doesn't seem so long when you're my age. Anyway, the point is that I can help your Mr. Lindell, only I can't do it alone. Did you know John Lindell? No, no, I didn't. No, Mr. Richardson, for that matter. The man that I knew was named Paulson. Who? I rented a room to Mr. Paulson, and he died about eight days ago of pneumonia. I was there when it happened. Well, that's unfortunate, but... Uh... Before he died, Mr. Paulson told me something about Mr. Richardson's murder. He said Mr. Lindell hadn't been responsible, that he, Mr. Paulson, had committed it for money. Oh, Mrs. Canby, listen to me. It was this man Lindell that bothered him. The fact that he was in prison for something he didn't do. I thought I should tell you this, Mr. Shelton, because you knew both of these gentlemen. It said so in the newspaper. Mrs. Canby, my, my dear woman. What? <sighs> I don't know what silly story you heard, but it's completely wrong. There wasn't any question about what happened. This border of yours, whatever his name is... Merely had an obsession. Well, just the same, I thought you could follow through on this business. Yeah. Tell the police. Because if it is true, Mr. Lindell should be freed. On evidence like that? Well, I don't know anything about evidence. I'm just telling you what I heard. <sighs> well, never mind. I suppose I should have told the police myself. Oh, wait, wait, Mrs. Canby. Uh, let me put your mind at rest. John Lindell is no longer in prison. He isn't? He's dead, Mrs. Canby. He's been dead for the last three years. Oh. He wasn't a young man when all this happened, when he accused his partner, Fred Richardson, of defrauding him and shot him dead. He died? In prison? Even if all you say is true, that this man was Richardson's murderer... You can't help John Lindell any longer. He's beyond that. But his name, don't you want to clear his name? Have you any proof? Any living witness? Just myself. But you'd be willing to involve yourself? Start a whole new investigation? Open up the whole dreadful mess again? Mrs. Canby, do you know that John Lindell had a daughter? No. But wouldn't that be all the more reason to do something? His daughter's married, living in Minneapolis, a husband and three children. People have forgotten about her father by now. Would you want that poor woman to see his name dragged through the newspapers a second time? But if her father was innocent... Forget it, Mrs. Canby. That's my advice to you. The old wound is healed. Don't reopen it. Oh, well, it troubles me so... I haven't thought of anything else since it happened. Perhaps if I saw a minister, if I had some advice from a man of God, maybe... Mrs. Canby, now you've said something. Now you've shown me the way. That's where our answer lies, dear woman, in prayer. Mm -hmm. In the forgiveness of our dear Lord. Will you pray with me, Mrs. Canby? Pray? Here? Why not? God is everywhere. Please. Join me. Dear Lord, tell us what to do. Give us your divine guidance. Show us the path to righteousness. Mr. Shelton, I... Help us, O oh Lord. Help us to understand. Teach us to forgive the sins of others and to forget them. To forget. I feel much better now, Mrs. Canby. 
Do you? I'm not sure. Let us turn this matter over to God, Miss Canby, not to the police, but to the Lord. It's in his hands now. Don't you agree? Well, in a way, that's true. Since they're dead now, all of them. Yes? Uh, Mrs. Canby? Yes? My name's Stuart Winfield, Mrs. Canby. Mm-hmm. I understand you have a room for rent? Yes, 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 I do. Well, I'm new in town. I just arrived from Philadelphia. I've been staying at a hotel, but I'd like something homier. Well, the room I have is $35 a week. I can't offer you any meals, but you can use the kitchen all you want. Well, that sounds good to me. Would, uh, would you like to see the room? Yes, ma'am, I sure would. Well, uh, come on in, ma'am. Thank you. By the way, how did you know I had a room for rent? Hmm? I was going to place an ad this weekend. Oh, I, uh, I, I guess someone at the hotel mentioned it. I, I forget just who. Say, this is a real fine old house, Mrs. Candy. Mm-hmm. I can see that I'm going to like this place. Just fine. <laughs> And so Mrs. Canby has a new boarder. He's a very personable young man with a great deal more charm than old Mr. Paulson had. Perhaps in a little while, Mrs. Canby will be able to forget her former boarder and the shocking confession he made on his deathbed. I'll be back shortly with Act Two. Winfield took no time at all to make himself at home in Ada Canby's big old house. He loved everything about his room. The fine old four-poster bed. The crazy quilt that Ada herself had sewn up 40 years ago. The lace curtains on the window. He even loved Mr. Paulson's blue parakeets. But what he really seemed to like best was Mrs. Canby herself. Just take me two minutes to get these clean sheets on the bed, Mr. Here, Peter. let me give you a hand. No, 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 I can manage. I've been making this bed for almost 50 years. 50? You've lived in this house that long? Moved in here when I got married back in 1919. My husband David bought it for us. Our only son, Ralph, was born in it. And you've lost them both? Yes, they're both dead, but I haven't lost them. Oh, yes, yes, I understand, Mrs. Canby. I guess I feel that way about my mom. Your mother's dead? Yes, she died when I was two. Well, listen, Mr. Winfield, are you sure you want these birds in your room? Hmm? I could take them to the parlor if you want. No, no, I think they're great. I I think everything's great about this house. Uh, But there is something you can do for me. What's that? Would you mind not calling me Mr. Winfield? Oh? Uh, That's what they call my father. My name's Stuart. Well, well, all right. Stuart? <laughs> Dear Walter, I think it's about time I told you that I have a boarder in my house. Mr. Winfield is the nicest young man you could want to meet. He's a great deal friendlier than my first gentleman, Mr. Paulson, and he seems to like nothing better than to sit around evenings and talk. We talk about his home and his parents and his plans for the future. I think the poor boy misses his home and family, and I'm sort of a substitute for all that. Hmm. You know, it isn't really fair, Mrs. Canby. You said I had kitchen privileges, but that doesn't mean you have to cook for me. Well, it's a pleasure, Stuart. I haven't had anyone to cook for in years. You're kidding. You mean to say you cook this good without practice? Oh, you're just being nice. I'm sure that stew is just plain ordinary. It's terrific, no kidding. It, it tastes like, well, it it tastes like home, if you know what I mean. Well, it depends on whose home you mean. <laughs> well, my mom cooks stews like this. That's what I meant. Your mom? Mm. Well, but she died when you were only two. Oh, well, I, I guess I, I didn't mean my mom exactly. I, I was thinking of my Aunt Martha. Uh, I mean, she's the one who sort of took over the cooking and stuff after my mother died. And my father's sister, you know? I see. 
Well, that was lucky that you had someone to take her place. Yeah, that's right. It's... Oh, Excuse me. My, Stuart, yeah. you're not coming down with anything, are you? <laughs> no, no, I'm fine. Just a little case of the sniffles. Listen, if your room isn't warm enough, I have an extra bucket. No, no, the room's just fine. Don't worry about it. Oh, you'll be sure now. I know I felt a little guilty about poor Mr. Paulson when he got sick. Uh, maybe I didn't take good enough care of him. Uh, Paulson? Mm-hmm. Was that your former boarder, the, uh, the bird lover? Yes, yes, that was his name, the poor man. Well, tell me about him. Well, I don't really know that much about him. He lived here less than two months. Well, what sort of a guy was he? Well, very quiet. He kept to himself. Did you say he was from South America? I don't remember if I did or not. Well, you must have said it. Yeah, yes, of course. He was American, but he'd been living in Brazil. I don't know why exactly. Although, come to think of it, maybe I do. What do you mean? Well, it, it just occurred to me that Brazil might be just the place for someone who came into a lot of money and, and wanted to leave the country. I don't understand. <laughs> oh, my. Uh, I really think you are getting a cold, Stuart. I'm getting that blanket out this minute. Now, wait, Mrs. Canby. I'd rather hear now, about... Never mind. I don't want to take any chances. I'll be right back. Yes, Mrs. Canby. Don't take any chances. Stuart? Yes? Come in. I bought your tray, Stuart. Oh. No, you shouldn't have. <laughs> you shouldn't have gone to all that trouble, Mrs. Kennedy. It wasn't a least bit of trouble. Besides, you've got to have some supper. Feed a cold and starve a fever. That's what this I is. mean, I, I was going to come out to the kitchen and, and get myself a sandwich or something. <laughs> you didn't have to bring it to me. Oh, look at that. Is that roast chicken? Well, that's what it's supposed to be. <laughs> uh, I hope it tastes all right. Noodle soup with dumplings. Mrs. Canby, you're spoiling me rotten. Do you know that? <laughs> yeah, I just thought it'd be a good idea if you stayed in bed and took it easy. You weren't planning to go out tonight, were you? No, no, I was just going to stay in and read for a while. <clears throat> Maybe watch television. Oh, that's good. Here, I'll just set this tray down. <laughs> oh, the service here is just too good. Oh, we <coughs> we never uh, we never finished our talk the other day about that border of yours, uh, Mr. Paulson. Well, there's not much to say about him, really. Well, you said something about his living in South America. <coughs> you said you thought you understood why he was living there. Sounded real interesting. Well, the truth is, Stuart, there is something to tell about Mr. Paulson. <coughs> maybe, maybe you can help me feel better about it all. About what? Now, I'm not going to tell you if you don't eat. <laughs> All right, Mrs. Canby, I'll, I'll eat. Well, it happened just about three weeks ago. <laughs> you know something, Mrs. Canby? That's about the best roast chicken I've had in years. I'm sure I spoiled your appetite with all my chatter. <laughs> no, no, that was a really interesting story. But what do you think of it all, Stuart? Hmm? Do you think I did the right thing? Well, frankly, Mrs. Canby, I do. Honestly? Well, this guy Chelton sounds a little screwy, but <laughs> I think he's all right. I mean, from a practical standpoint. Then you agree with him? Sure. This man Richardson's dead, right? And... What's his name, Lindell? Yes. Well, he's dead too, right? And poor Mr. Paulson, the man who supposedly killed Richardson. Well, there you are. <coughs> Nothing you can do will bring any of them back, right? Well, yes, but just the same. And you know the police, Mrs. Canby. They'll be hounding you forever. <coughs> tracking mud into your parlor, bothering you with questions. No, Mrs. Canby, you're too nice a person to put up with that kind of thing. You mean too old a person? I just think Mr. Chelton was right. Let sleeping dogs lie. Yes, that's what I keep telling myself, but you know something? What? <coughs> There's one thing Mr. Chelton forgot. And it me too, I suppose. What's that? Why, the real murderer. He may still be alive, even if all the others are gone. Don't you see? No, I... I don't. Even if Mr. Lindell can't be helped anymore, 
That doesn't mean the real murderer should get away. But the real murderer is dead. Paulson. No, the killer is the man who hired Mr. Paulson. Don't you see? Is it right that he should get away with it? Now, wait a minute. <coughs> You're jumping to conclusions. No, I'm not. Mr. Paulson told me that he was hired to do this thing. Well, maybe he was hired by Lindell. Maybe Lindell hired him and then Paulson got cold feet and... Lindell did the shooting himself. No, I'm sure that isn't true. You see, I read the newspaper article all about it. Well, you you really were thorough about this, weren't you, Mrs. Candy? <laughs> you poor man. That cold's gone to your chest now, hasn't it? No, I'm all, I'm all right. Stop. Stop worrying about me. Let's talk about this. This other problem of yours. Well, maybe I'm making it more of a problem than it should be. Maybe if I just told the police everything, I could forget it once and for all. No, I, uh, I, I really couldn't advise that, Mrs. Candy. Well, it said in the newspaper story that the two men were partners in that investment firm. And Mr. Lindell thought that his partner, Richardson, was cheating, taking money out of the firm... And that's why he's supposed to have shot him. Wasn't there a witness to the shooting? Why, yes, I think there was. Come to think of it, it was Mr. Shelton. That's right, that's right. Well, <laughs> doesn't, that, doesn't that wrap it up for you? Well, it would if it wasn't for Mr. Paulson. Listen, Mrs. Canby, you know how much I like you. Well, in just a few days, you're more like family to me than my Aunt Martha ever was. Well, it's nice of you to say, Stuart. And that's why I want you to listen to me about this. That's why I want you to forget about this whole foolish thing. And <laughs> Listen to you. You sound awful, Stuart. Just tell me. No, I'm all right. No, you're not all right. I'm going to get you some cough medicine right this minute. Hello? Oh, Mr. Chowton, it's, it's me, Winfield. Well, what's happening? I, I think I better stick around for a few more days, Mr. Chowton. The old lady's beginning to get fidgety, if, if you know what I mean. <laughs> well, something tells me that Stuart Winfield isn't such a nice young man after all. Could it be that he wasn't telling Mrs. Canby the truth about his dear mother and his Aunt Martha? Could he have not told her the truth about his plans for the future? Of course, the real issue is, what sort of plan does he have for Ada Canby's future? I'll be back shortly with Act Three. I'm High Brown, and as producer of Radio Mystery Theater, welcome to the premiere of an exciting venture in modern radio, the return of spine-tingling suspense and mystery seven times a week with fine actors and actresses and one other star player. Your imagination. We'd like to hear whether you're glad radio drama is back. So we're holding a weekly drawing for three weeks with 50 prizes a week, two AM-FM stereophonos, two travel clock radios, and 46 anthologies of modern suspense. All you do is send us your name and address to Mystery Theater, Box 50, Radio City Station, New York 119. Box 50, Radio City Station, New York 119. 19. Offer good everywhere unless locally prohibited. Poor Mrs. Canby. She isn't sleeping well tonight. But of course, Mrs. Canby has good reasons for insomnia. Her thoughts are whirling. Her border steward was right. She doesn't want the bother of going to the police. And she firmly believes in the old adage, if you don't trouble trouble, trouble won't trouble you. But still, 
He'd never even come to this house. Mrs. Canby, I killed Richardson. I did it. Do I ever forget the sound of that man's voice? Lindell is innocent. Lindell is innocent. That poor man. All the years he spent in jail for something he didn't do. Let sleeping dogs lie, Mrs. Canby. My aunt Martha always said, let sleeping dogs lie. Oh, if only I could get some sleep. Let us turn this matter over to God, Mrs. K. Not to the police. Not to the police. Not to the police. What a strange man he is, that Mr. Chelton. Where he talked about God praying at his desk. Of course, God is everywhere, but his desk. I killed Richardson. I murdered him for money. I was paid. I was paid. Paid? Paid. Someone had to pay him. Mr. Paulson wasn't the only guilty one. Someone else was, too. Forget. 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 Oh, dear Lord. Mr. Chelton. Chelton. Chelton, what did that newspaper article say? The chief witness against Mr. Lindell was Arnold Chelton. But how could he be a witness? Just something that never happened. How could he be? I'll have to tell someone. I'll have to talk to someone. Yes, I'll tell Stuart about it. In the morning. Stuart, are you awake? Yes, I'm up, Mrs. Canby. Come in. Oh, oh no. Now, don't tell me I'm getting breakfast in bed, too. Oh, I know you had a terrible night last night, Stuart. You were coughing much worse than ever. I guess that medicine wasn't very good. I'm sorry I kept you awake, Mrs. Candy. Oh, that wasn't your fault. No. Something else kept me up. Well, what was that? Oh, my mind, I guess. Maybe I should say my conscience. Well, that sounds serious. <laughs> well, it is something serious, Stuart. Well, I might have let a man get away with murder. No, it's even worse than that. He did something worse than murder. You're talking about Paulson again. <laughs> no, I'm talking about the man who hired Mr. Paulson. He didn't just have that man Richardson shot. He let an innocent person go to jail and die there. Now, that's like committing two murders, if you ask me. I have to tell you something that occurred to me last night. Sure, go ahead. Well, it's about Mr. Chelton. Mr. Arnold Chelton. Yeah? Go on. I I'm listening. Stuart, I wonder if maybe the reason Mr. Chelton was so upset with me, the reason he didn't want me to go to the police, was because he was afraid. Explain what you mean. Well, what I mean is maybe Mr. Chelton had good reason, besides the one he told me. He was working for both Mr. Richardson and Mr. Lundell at the time of the murder. <coughs> well, so what? Well, he was also the chief witness at the trial, a witness for the prosecution. But he saw the shooting, didn't he? But that's just the point. He saw Mr. Lundell shoot Mr. Richardson. Well, that's not what you told me last time. I mean, that he was an eyewitness. No, that's right. He didn't actually see the shooting. 
He was miles away when it happened. I don't quite remember the details. If there was something about a phone call, maybe? Y- yes, yes, that's what it was. He claimed that Mr. Richardson was talking to him on the phone when Mr. Lindell showed up at his apartment. He said that Richardson cried out something about Lindell having a gun. And then he heard the shot. But how could that have happened if the gun was fired by Mr. Paulson? If, Mrs. Canby... That's the big little word, isn't it? If... (laughs) But don't you see what I'm saying, Stuart? Arnold Shelton had the most to gain. Gain? From what? From both these men leaving the firm. That would leave the whole thing to him. All those customers, all the investments he handled. All the commissions, or whatever they call it. Are you accusing this guy Shelton of being the killer? Yes, it's it's the only answer, Stuart. Well, look, if that was the case, the, <coughs> the police would have figured it out. But they didn't. There was nothing in the stories I read that pointed any suspicion at Mr. Chelton. I don't suppose it even occurred to them. And now, the company is all his. Well, you don't... You don't call that evidence, do you? <laughs> well, then why didn't he let me go to the police? Why did he try so hard to talk me out of it? That man was praying, Stuart. He was taking the name of the Lord in vain. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, Stuart. I'm so sorry. I won't bother you anymore. I know what I have to do anyway. <coughs> Mrs. Candy. I won't wait. be gone long, Stuart. No, no, wait. But the minute I get back, I'm going to call Dr. George and ask him to come over. You're sick. Never mind the doctor. Are you calling the police? No, no, I won't call them. You're right. I don't want them tracking mud in my parlor. I'm going down to the station house and talk to them. I'll get dressed now and go straight there. Please, please think about what you're doing. I'll tell them what I know and they can do the rest. Now, you try to eat something, Stuart. Please. Mrs. Candy. (coughs) Sheldon. What is this, Winfield? I told you not to call me in the office. It's an emergency. (laughs) You sound terrible. What's the matter with you? I'm sick. Only you're going to be a lot sicker. What are you talking about? The old lady. I can't stop her. She's decided to talk. What? She figured it out. Figured out exactly what you did, Shelton, and how you did it. You fool. You've got to stop her. Do you hear me? That wasn't part of the deal, Shelton. It's all of the deal now. The price didn't include anything like that. The price just doubled. Old ladies are always having accidents. Make her have one. Make her have one now, Winfield. Yeah. All right. All right. She's gonna. She's gonna have a fall down the cellar steps. Right now. I gotta get my robe on and my slippers. I. I gotta hurry. <laughs> Is that you? Open up, Mrs. Candy. For heaven's sake. <coughs> Stuart Winfield, what are you doing out of bed? Now, you go right back there this second. I got, I got to talk to you, Mrs. Canby, before you go to the police. Just listen to you. You're all winded. You can hardly talk, Stuart. Now, go back to bed before you catch pneumonia, too. Now, don't go, Mrs. Canby. It would be better if you never went to the police. Better for you. Better for me. For you? I don't understand. Well, then I... I wouldn't have to hurt you, Mrs. Canby. <laughs> That's what I mean. I wouldn't have to do anything bad but, to you. Stuart, what in the world are you talking about? Come on, old lady. You're, not... You're smart, all right. You really think things through. So now, think a little harder. You knew? <laughs> Stuart, you knew about Mr. Paul. That's right. Because Mr. Uh, Chapman told you. Now you're getting there, Mrs. Canby. And that's why you rented it. That's uh, why you were 
sensible. Just to watch you, Mrs. Candy. Just to see oh, that you yes. stayed sensible. Mr. <laughs> Mr. Chesson did. I was hoping you'd never change your mind about calling the police. No, no. I didn't want this part of it. This isn't the part I like. Oh, let me go, Stuart. Just relax, oh, Mrs. Just Candy. Go. Just oh, take it easy. Oh, Stuart, please, please, don't. Why, you're as light as a feather, Mrs. Candy. Oh, just like my Aunt Martha would have been if I, if I had an Aunt Martha. Stuart, please, put me down, please. We've got a date now, Mrs. Oh, Candy. Let me go. Stop! Put up such a fight, Mrs. Oh, Candy. I'm, I'm sick, remember? Stop! No! Shut, shut your eyes. Please, shut your eyes and don't look down. Oh, God. Uh, Stuart, those stairs. Shut your eyes, old lady. Help me, Stuart. They'll all be over. Stuart! 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 that it wasn't you at the bottom of those stairs. Well, will he be all right, Dr. George? Now, what do you want to worry about that man for? Uh, Truth is, his uh, injuries don't amount to very much. A couple of broken ribs seem to be the worst of it. But he'll be a patient for some time before they can put him in prison where he belongs. Him and his uh, friend. What was that man's name again? You mean Mr. Chatham? Have they arrested him? Yeah, yeah. That's what the police detective said. I don't understand. Stuart's injuries aren't serious. It's not the fall that made Winfield so sick. His case was diagnosed as simple pneumonia at first. And then I remembered about your first border. Nelson, was it? No, Paulson. Yes, Paulson. But he had pneumonia, too. He died of it. Oh, is, is pneumonia contagious? Yes, yes, it is, but this disease was even more contagious. It's a pneumonia caused by a disease called psittacosis, better known as parrot fever. Uh-huh. You get it from sick birds, like the parakeets in your spare room. Oh, no. Mr. Paulson's bird? Sorry, Ada, but... It had to be taken out and destroyed. Oh, what a shame. Hey, there's one reason I, I feel sorry for him. They saved your life. Made Mr. Winfield too weak even to throw a little old lady down a flight of steps. Uh, those poor little creatures. Yeah, but you can be grateful they didn't make you sick, too. Mm. Parrot fever is so contagious that... No more than one person in a thousand could be exposed to it and escape infection. It was pretty darn close to a miracle, Ada. They're hard to kill, Doctor. Remember? The old ones are hard to kill. They say that people are living longer than ever before. And when we look at Ada Canby, we can understand why. She's a tough old lady. So tough she could withstand the threats of man, beasts, and bird. So let that be a warning to all those who think that our senior citizens are easy prey for crime. Watch out. They may turn the tables on you. Or the stairs. I'll be back shortly. have one final comment for you on behalf of Ada Canby and old people everywhere. There's a saying, there's no fool like an old fool, but it's also true that there's no wisdom and strength like old wisdom and strength. There. Does that make you feel better about your next birthday? Our cast included Agnes Moorhead, Leon Janney, and Roger DeCoven. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Now, a preview of our next tale. You spoil me shamefully. (laughs) And that night, I spoiled.
spoiled her just a bit more by bringing hot cocoa to her in bed. Well, I'll drink it down now. Yes. Does it taste all right? Oh, it tastes just fine. Now, that was very good news, because I'd prepared the hot cocoa myself, and I had no idea whether 25 melted sleeping pills would seriously affect the flavor. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, to visit sponsors you hear about during the show, sign up for my newsletter, enter contests, connect with me on social media, hear other podcasts that I host, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated. Plus, you can visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Just outside of Chicago, Archer Avenue leads motorists past Resurrection Cemetery, the final resting spot of a young woman killed in the 1930s. Many believe the same young woman mysteriously returns to the cemetery night after night, dancing and hitchhiking her way back down the avenue. Of all of Chicago's ghost stories, this one has been told and retold for over 80 years. Resurrection Mary, as she is called, was reportedly first sighted in 1939 when a man named Jerry Paulus met a beautiful young blonde woman in a white dress at a local dance hall. After dancing together all night, Jerry offered the beautiful stranger a ride home. She directed him down Archer Avenue, stopping in front of Resurrection Cemetery, where she vanished before reaching the front gates. Decades later, tales of encounters with Resurrection Mary continued to surface. One of the most prominent sightings of the spirit was reported in the Suburban Trib in 1979. Reporter Bill Geist interviewed a man named Ralph for an article aptly titled Cryptic Rider Leaves Taxi Driver with the Willies. The taxi driver requested that his last name be withheld, although he stuck by his chilling story. He didn't want people to think he was crazy. Ralph explained that he had picked up a strange young woman in a white dress one evening who had directed him down Archer Avenue. She was mostly silent, except to remark that the snows had come early this year. When she abruptly requested that he stop in front of Resurrection Cemetery, Ralph slammed on the brakes. He looked away only for a moment when something happened that made his blood run cold. When I turned, she was gone, vanished, and the door never opened. May the good Lord strike me dead, it never opened. Throughout the years, dozens of other men have come forward with eerily similar stories. They all involved an attractive blonde wearing a white party dress who would dance and ultimately disappear near the cemetery. Some claimed to see her walking down the road, sometimes even jumping into oncoming traffic. Others would say that they stopped to give the girl a ride and, in traditional vanishing hitchhiker form, the white-clad woman would disappear as they neared Resurrection Cemetery. Sometimes, after she got out of the car, 
and sometimes as the driver walked around to the passenger side to open her door. The stories of the girl behind the ghost vary. The most prominent is that Mary, as she has come to be called, was out one evening with a boyfriend, dancing at the O. Henry Ballroom, which is now the Willow Brook Ballroom. They got into a spat and, unable to stand his company any longer, the young woman stormed out of the ballroom to walk home alone. Not long after departing the dance hall, Mary was struck by a car. The driver fled the scene, leaving her for dead. Mary's parents later found her body. They dressed her in a white gown and dancing shoes and buried her in Resurrection Cemetery. The young woman's spirit then rose from the grave, wandering the cemetery grounds and haunting her favorite dancing places. Unlike other reported ghosts, it seems that this spirit does not hide from human contact. Rather, she seeks it out. The story of Resurrection Mary's death explains another type of strange encounter that people have had with her spirit. Several people traveling down Archer Avenue have made distressed phone calls to police, claiming to have discovered a young woman's body on the side of the road, seemingly abandoned after a hit-and-run accident. When officers report to the scene, the body seems to have vanished. The only sign left behind was a dent in the grass, in the shape of a human body. Over the years, many researchers have attempted to pin the ghost's identity on young women named Mary that were killed in automotive accidents in the late 1920s or early 1930s. One theory poses that the disturbed spirit is Mary Bregovy, a 21-year-old woman who was killed in 1934 when the driver of the vehicle she was riding in crashed into a structure on the side of the road. Another possibility is that Resurrection Mary is the ghost of Anna Norcus, whose devotion to the Virgin Mary led her to adopt the name Marisia, which is Lithuanian for Mary, as her middle name. Norcus was killed in an automobile accident in 1927 on her way home from an evening spent at the O. Henry Ballroom. However, Mary Bregovi was a brunette, and Anna Norcus was just shy of 13 years old, so neither matched the description of a blonde in her early 20s. They also weren't involved in hit-and-run accidents, leaving the true identity of Resurrection Mary a mystery. Another chilling aspect of this local legend involves the cemetery itself. Resurrection Cemetery encompasses over 540 acres, making it one of the largest and possibly most haunted cemeteries in North America. One night, a man reported seeing a young woman who looked like she was locked in the vast cemetery. When a police officer went to go check out the scene, he didn't see anyone there. However, the bars on the gate of the cemetery looked scorched and warped. Although authorities chalk it up to a maintenance accident with a truck, legend has it that Resurrection Mary seared the bars with her hands when she grasped them, as if trying to free herself. In any case, Mary's story has captivated ghost hunters for decades. Some write it off as merely an urban legend, but the consistent sightings of this mysterious figure over the years are undeniably striking. Up next, I'll have the story of Chicago's Bachelor's Grove, one of the most haunted cemeteries in the world. Do you have a true paranormal story that's happened to you or someone you know? Share it by clicking on Tell Your Story at WeirdDarkness.com. Weird Darkness returns in just a moment. There is a knock at the door late at night. You answer it to find two small children standing there. You're suddenly filled with an inexplicable fear. Let us in, they say. We need to use the phone. It's at that point the fear turns to utter dread as you see that these kids have completely black eyes. The Black Eyed Kids is an exploration of this terrifying phenomenon using true stories of encounters with black-eyed kids submitted to the My Haunted Life 2 website. 
G. Michael Vasey examines the evidence and investigates the terrifying black-eyed kids phenomenon, coming to some startling and shocking conclusions. Are they demonic soul-eaters responsible for the disappearance of some of the 90,000 Americans missing at any point in time? Or is this just another urban legend, another boogeyman designed to keep you awake at night? Listen to the book and find out. The Black Eyed Kids by G. Michael Vasey, narrated by Weird Darkness host Darren Marlar. Hear a free sample on the audiobooks page at WeirdDarkness.com. of Flashman G's present I Love a Mystery. Here's why many people are nervous, run down, get severe colds, have poor appetite, suffer from digestive troubles. They're not getting enough vitamins. You should know there's now a more effective way to get extra vitamins. It's to eat the new Flashman's High Vitamin Yeast. This fresh yeast can help the body make fuller use of vitamins in the food by acting to tone up slow digestion. Just look at the label and see what a bargain in vitamins this new yeast is. Two cakes a day give you 6,200 units of A, the resistance-building vitamin, 800 units of D, the bone vitamin, and liberal quantities of B and G, the vitamins so important for steady nerves, good appetite, and full energy. Begin tomorrow. Eat two cakes a day of Flashman's new high-vitamin yeast. Eat one cake a half hour before breakfast or lunch, the other cake a half hour before supper. See if soon you don't feel more energetic and if you don't have an easier time with nasty colds. A new Carlton Morse adventure thriller. Nine o'clock in the morning finds the three soldiers of adventure, Jack Packard, Doc Long, and Reggie York, in the Roxy City Jail. Roxy is a coast town of 5,000, at one time notorious as a liquor smuggling center, but for several years now has been out of the public eye. The three men had set out from San Francisco last night, hard-pressed by the police, heading for Sacramento, but had got off the highway and headed toward the coast. Within half an hour of Roxy, they had a flat tire, and then was when things began to pop. First, a girl came along the highway, followed by a man. Near them, the man shot at the girl. The girl, unhurt, fainted, and young Reggie, the Englishman, jumped the man, knocking him cold with one blow. A car loomed up in the distance, and the men dumped the unconscious pair in the back of their car. But instead of speeding past, the machine drew up to them, and a posse headed by the mayor of Roxy took them into custody. And so at nine o'clock this morning, the three find themselves none too comfortably ensconced in the city lockup. The kid's still asleep, Doc. Yeah, he ain't only asleep, but he's smiling in his sleep. It's disgusting. Well, let him alone. Anybody who can sleep on a jail bed deserves his rest. Dad gummin, Jack. I'm a cheerful kind of cuss, and I got me a lot of faith in mankind. But if I stay in this year Roxy City dog pound another 24 hours, I'm... Oh, I don't know. I've seen worse jails. Now, look, Jack. We hightail it out of Frisco to keep out of the jug. How come you're liking jailhouses so sudden? Not all jails, just this jail. Mm, just another hoosk, as far as I can see. And something else. I'm getting just a little bit tired of being shoved around by a bunch of hick town big shots. Look, Doc, we all know we didn't have to take what we got last night. We could have cleaned out the mayor and his posse quicker than it takes to tell it. Well, why didn't we? Because there's something going on in this town, I want to find out what it is. Why? Maybe because I'm just curious. 
Maybe because I get kind of burned when I see a big gorilla taking a pot shot at a girl. Mm -hmm. Because you're curious, we all got to join in the course of the prisoner song. That's right. Until my curiosity is satisfied. Mm-hmm. Uh, like to bet me 50 bucks that I can't walk out of this can in half hour? I'll kick you so hard you'll be wearing the seat of your pants for a collar if you do. Oh, sure, partner. I was just thinking out loud. Well, don't. And if you'd only let us get just a little bit dangerous, Jack, what kills my soul is having these here no-good chiselers are shoving us around and thinking they're getting away with it. That's just what I want them to think. The more contempt they have, the less attention they're going to pay to us. And the more we find out, the better position we'll be in when we get ready to strike. Hmm. Speaking of striking, I'd sure like to bust that chief of police. He's got the ugliest mug this side of a menagerie. Shut up, somebody's coming. Which of you birds is Jack Packard? I am. Yeah. Well, come up to the gate. Am I going out? Yeah. Little party over at the mayor's office. Oh, wait till I get my coat. Well, slap into it. All right. I'm ready. Now, how about me coming along, Jack? How about you staying right where you are? Well, bless your heart. Cut it out, Doc. All right, let's go, policeman. Now, take hold of the crossbar with both hands. What's that for? Do what I tell you. Sure. Huh. And cuffs, huh? I must be a pretty desperate fellow. I don't let nobody the mayor's interested in out of his cell without the cuffs. Now then. Step out. I've never walked out to meet a firing squad, but, brother, this has all the earmarks. Now then, right in here. Suits me. Yeah? Here's your party, Mayor. Bring him in. Right in. So. Well, why don't you sit down? Thanks. That's all, Sergeant. Wait outside the door. Right. <laughs> Spend a comfortable night as guest of the city of Roxy, I hope. You don't hope anything of the kind. No, I don't suppose I give a hope one way or the other. Well, if you're through with introductory niceties, let's get down to business. What business? Well, that's up to you. You didn't bring me over here just to gloat over me. Right. I want to know what you three men are doing in Roxy. We weren't in Roxy. That is, not until you brought us here. And here's a question I'd like to ask. Do you, as mayor of Roxy, always lead your posse of police when they're out rounding up suspicious characters? I am asking the questions. Well, just the same as a funny thing for a mayor to be doing. Just why are you questioning me? Where's the city attorney? Where's the chief of police? I am asking the questions. Oh, well, I'm doing a better job. I repeat, what were you doing in the vicinity of Roxy last night? Well, if you'd examined our so-called car, you'd notice we had a flat tire. I did. We were traveling through, got a flat tire, and that's all there is to it. And I suppose the unconscious bodies of, of that girl and Ben Sterling climbed into the back of your car by mistake. No, we put them there. That's better. Confess kidnappers. Confess grandmothers. That girl was walking down the road, followed by Sterling. If that's what his name is. The girl went by, and just as Sterling got in our range of vision, he pulled out a gun and took a pot shot at her. What? You heard me. We jumped Sterling and knocked him out. And the girl passed out, and just then your car came along, and we dumped in the back of our car, thinking you'd pass by. Well, that's a lie. That's the truth. I say it's a lie. I say you're either dumber than you'll look, or else you don't want to hear the truth. You still claim you don't know who that girl is? I don't. She's Phyllis Gordon. Oh. I suppose to be impressed. Well, at least you know who she is now. Yeah, Phyllis Gordon. 
Well, who's Phyllis Gordon? Don't you know what my name is? No, I don't. Gordon. Gordon, what do you think? I'm Frank Gordon, mayor of Roxy. Oh. Oh, yes. And Phyllis Gordon is your daughter. Right. And Ben Sterling's one and only duty is to stick by my daughter and protect her from just such birds as you. You mean Sterling is her guard? So you can see where your story stands now. Well, Gordon, all I got to say to you is that if you want your daughter in this world, you better get a new guard and get him fast. You're going to stick to that story, then? Haven't you talked to your daughter? Yes. She says she was shot at, all right. Well? I also talked to Ben Sterling. He says she was shot at, too. Well, he should know. And from his story, there's every reason to believe that you or one of your men fired that shot. Interesting. The only fly in that ointment is that you didn't find any weapons on us. You could have ditched them. Did you examine Sterling's gun? He had the chance while he was still unconscious. Yes. And you found three shots recently fired from it, didn't you? Yes. Sterling said he returned your fire. Well, why only three shots? If I'd been returning the fire of ambushers, I'd have emptied my gun at them. He said you overpowered him. He took a shot at the kid just before he was knocked out. One shot at the girl, two shots at the kid. I'd give a lot to know whether you're lying. Well... I'm giving you the best advice you ever had. Take that guy Sterling off your daughter. You're talking very well for a man who's facing a murder charge. Oh. So that's how it is. What do you mean that's how it is? There's more to this than showing on the surface. If you don't already know it, there is. Well, if I'm involved in it, maybe I better know a little more. All right, try this. There's a roadhouse about a hundred yards from where we picked you three men up. A roadhouse. I saw it from the road, but I thought it was an old farmhouse. It's a roadhouse. Last night, my daughter went out there with a young fellow she's been going around with. Boy named Arthur Young. Well, what about Ben Sterling? He trailed him in a second car. Maybe I'm a little bit curious, but will you tell me why the daughter of the mayor needs a bodyguard? That hasn't anything to do with what happened last night. Phyllis and the boy were just leaving the dance floor when somebody outside shot through a window and killed Young. Hmm. Nice town you have here, Mayor. Phyllis ran out of the place and Ben Sterling went after her. And I'm convinced that the same man who shot Arthur Young shot at my daughter. Well, in that case, you better lock up Ben Sterling fast. Ben Sterling is one of my most trusted henchmen. Then Ben Sterling's not only double-crossing you, but knifing you in the back. If you think he's not, you're not long for this world. But I still think you're lying. Well, where's Ben Sterling now? In a cell down at the jail. Well, why, if I'm lying? Look, have they got the bullet that killed the boy? Yes. And Sterling's gun? Sterling's gun disappeared. What's that? You had it last night. I locked it in my desk drawer. You can see for yourself the drawer's been forced. And you still think I'm lying? Look here, Packard. You're an old hand at this game. What gives you that impression? I've handled too many greenhorns in my time not to know the real thing when I see it. So what? So I'd like to make you a proposition. Huh. With a cop outside the door and handcuffs on my wrist, you want to make me a proposition. You accept my proposition and we'll forget all that. Yeah, we'll talk fast but distinctly. I'm offering you the job as bodyguard for my daughter. What's that mean? Just that. Bodyguard to Phyllis Gordon. It doesn't make sense. You don't think so? One minute you, you, one minute you threaten me with murder charges and the next you invite me to guard your daughter. If I'm satisfied, what have you got to lose? You know, Mayor... The more I hear about your lovely town of Roxy, the more I'm inclined to think that something's boiling way down underneath. I've made you an offer. Are you going to accept it? And one of these days, the whole mess is going to blow up. I've got other things to do besides talk with you. What's your answer? Mayor, Miss Phyllis Gordon has got herself a new bodyguard. Are you thinking of eating extra vitamins? It's a good idea at this time of the year especially. Studies show a great many people are not getting enough vitamins from their regular meals. But remember, it makes a difference how you get your vitamins. Sometimes people may not get the full good of the vitamins they do eat. But now, there's a way to get vitamins in more helpful form. It's to eat the new Flashman's High Vitamin Yeast. This new yeast is richer than ever in four essential vitamins. And by acting to tone up slow digestion, this yeast can help the body make fuller use of the vitamins and other foods you eat. 
two cakes a day of Flashman's new high vitamin yeast supply all the extra vitamins A, B, and D the average person needs. Also, an abundant supply of vitamin G. Eat one cake a half hour before breakfast or lunch. Another cake a half hour before supper. Keep this up and see if you don't feel more energetic and if you're not bothered less with bad colds. Remember staying up late at night while growing up, watching your local TV station's horror host presenting a terrible B-horror movie or so-bad-it's-good sci-fi flick from the 1950s? That's what the Monster Channel at WeirdDarkness.tv has to offer – all day, every day. You can visit WeirdDarkness.tv and immediately be entertained by a horror host and horrible movie. You can even invite your friends to watch with you and use the chat feature to talk about what you're watching. And our monthly Weirdo Watch Party takes place there as well. Get your frights and funnies 24-7, 365 at WeirdDarkness.tv. Welcome back to Weird Darkness. I'm Darren Marlar. Now back to more haunted cemeteries, graveyards, and mausoleums on Weird Darkness. Elsewhere in Chicagoland, in the Chicago suburbs, screened from the city by the nearby Rubio Woods Forest Preserve, lies an abandoned graveyard widely believed to be the most haunted place in the region. Over the years, more than a hundred different hauntings and otherworldly encounters have been reported in Bachelors Grove Cemetery, from floating orbs of light above gravestones to a phantom farmhouse and even a two-headed apparition. Once part of a larger settlement, the land that became Bachelors Grove Cemetery was set aside for use as a burying place in the 1800s, when the body of its first permanent resident was interred there. The cemetery was originally called Everdon, in honor of Samuel Everdon who donated the property. According to those who lived and worked near the cemetery, it was once much like a park, with a nearby lagoon used for fishing and swimming. Reports of the paranormal began surfacing in the 1950s, though Bachelors Grove had already earned a sinister reputation. Gangsters from the 1920s and 1930s allegedly used the area to dump bodies and hide illegal firearms. By the 1960s, the number of funerals at Bachelors Grove had dwindled to near zero. By the time the final burial took place in 1989, vandals began raiding the site each night, knocking over and stealing headstones. According to some, coffins were even dug up and corpses desecrated. As Bachelors Grove slipped into abandonment, reports of nefarious activity intensified. Forest rangers patrolling the area reportedly found the remains of animals that had been ritualistically mutilated, along with other evidence of occult activities. Several people reported seeing satanic rituals being carried out in the cemetery, complete with animal sacrifice. The number of ghostly encounters grew as well. Some of the earliest reported phenomena involved orbs of blue light appearing above graves and seemingly moving with intelligence. Another strange tale tells of a phantom farmhouse. Though seldom seen in the same place twice, the building is said to almost always appear as a white homestead with wooden columns and a porch swing on the front porch and a lantern burning in the window. If one tries to approach the phantom structure, however, it begins to shrink, receding with each step until it disappears altogether. The cemetery's nearby lagoon plays host to a well-known haunting as well. Many have seen a ghostly farmer and his horse still pulling a plow along its banks. The sighting stems from the legend of a local farmer who drowned in the lagoon alongside his horse in the 1870s. So the story goes, the horse rushed into the lagoon without reason dragging the farmer to his death. Encounters of a two-headed creature emerging from the lagoon at night 
have led some to believe that the vision is actually the half-formed apparition of the farmer and his horse. Other common ghostly sightings in Bachelors Grove Cemetery include a white lady who carries her infant through the grounds under the glow of the full moon, figures dressed in robes, a mysterious black dog, and a light like a red skyrocket that speeds up and down the trail leading to the entrance of the cemetery. Nor are the hauntings restricted just to the burying ground. The nearby roads have also been the site of numerous reports of vanishing or phantom vehicles. Unsurprisingly, Bachelors Grove is a favorite midnight destination for legend trippers and ghost hunters alike. Several people have returned with what they consider photographic evidence of the supernatural. Perhaps the most striking is a picture taken in 1991 by members of the Ghost Research Society that shows a woman sitting on a gravestone in the cemetery. Dubbed the Madonna of Bachelors Grove, the photograph has been published in both the Chicago Sun-Times and the National Examiner and is one of the most famous or infamous paranormal photos of all time. We'll continue with more stories of haunted graveyards and cemeteries when Weird Darkness returns. If you or someone you know is struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction, please visit the Hope in the Darkness page at WeirdDarkness.com. There, I've gathered numerous resources to find hope and solutions. For those suffering from thoughts of suicide or self-harm, there is the Suicide and Crisis Lifeline as well as the Crisis Text Line. Both have trained counselors at all hours to help those in need, and the page even includes text numbers for those in the U.S., Canada, United Kingdom, and Ireland. Those struggling with depression can get help through the Seven Cups website and app, and there's information for anyone to read more about what depression truly is and how to identify it through our friends at ifred.org. There are resources for those who battle addictions, be it drugs, alcohol, or self-destructive behavior, along with help for those related to addicts. The page has links to help you find a therapist or counselor, to find help for those who have a family member with Alzheimer's or dementia, help for those in a crisis pregnancy, and more. These resources are always there when you or someone you love needs them on the Hope in the Darkness page at WeirdDarkness.com. presents The Shadow, the man of mystery who strikes terror in the very souls of sharpsters, lawbreakers, and criminals. Friends, there's no longer any need for you to rely on guesswork when it comes to buying fuel. Now you can get the best fuel for home use, and know it at a glance, too. For blue coal, the finest of Pennsylvania hard coal, is colored a harmless blue at the mines for your protection, so that you can identify it instantly. To be sure that the fuel you buy is a safe, healthy, economical fuel, get America's finest anthracite. Ask for blue coal by name. Order your supply tomorrow. I can't stand it, I tell you. Always at nine o'clock it comes. But if I hear that horrible thing again, I, I'll go crazy. Oh, this awful house. But it's quiet, my dear. Way out in the country like this, I can install my laboratory here as soon as I get around to it. As for these strange sounds, well, haunted houses have always fascinated me. I've always wanted to meet a ghost. 
shake hands with him. Invite him to tea. Stop talking like that. It's serious. Oh, I've tried to stand it for your sake, Arthur. But I don't know how much longer. My heart isn't strong and I... Hear it? But that's only the wind, isn't it? No. It always starts like that. You know it does. Don't move. Listen. Arthur, it's coming. It's coming. It's coming. A ghost, eh? Well, we'll see. I'll meet him this time. I'll meet him halfway, too. Stop! Stop! Come. We'll both meet him. Give me your hand. No! Carolyn. Carolyn, it stopped. Can't you hear me? Goodness me. Has the shock killed her? No, her heart still beats. She's only fainted again. Hmm? Just passed out of here. Turn the next corner, Lamont. It's that big house set on the hill. May I ask, Margot, the reason for this late call on Carolyn Sneed? Oh, I'd like to know what's the matter with the poor woman. I got an awful shock when I saw her in town last week. She looks positively haggard. I never saw such a change come over a person. Married life may not agree with her. She was a spinster for close to 40 years, wasn't she? I know, but I think she was foolish. Carolyn has nearly a million dollars in her own name. She didn't have to marry. Yes, but... Right now, I'm not the shadow. Remember, I'm just your patient chauffeur, darling. Lamont Cranston, in need of a rest from my famous mystery man role. That last adventure took a lot out of me, you know. Well, a marriage problem is hardly... The... Seriously, though. Nobody knows anything about this man she married. He came into town six months ago, met Carolyn in some accidental manner at the county fair, and proceeded to rush her off her feet. I've met him only once, but I don't like his looks. Hmm. Something sinister, I gather. Hence the shadow idea. Well, who is he anyway? Professor Arthur Sneed, I believe he calls himself. He has a small office in town where he's supposed to be working on inventions or something. Well, here we are. Hmm. I'm usually pretty level-headed, Margot, but don't let your aversion for this man we're seeing be too apparent. <laughs> Dreary place, isn't it? I don't see any bell. I guess you're supposed to use the knocker. Here he comes. Well, who is... Oh, it's you, Miss Lane. Yes. Good evening, Professor Sneed. I hope we aren't too late. Too late? And too late for what? Why, I phoned Carolyn that we'd drop in just to say hello. Uh, well, well, she didn't tell me. Uh, Carolyn isn't feeling well at the moment. I, I'm sorry. Good night. Oh, but please, I only want to see her for a moment. That is, unless it's something really serious. Well, it isn't as serious as she pretends to think it is, but... Uh, well, come in. Thank you. Uh, this is my friend, Lamont Cranston. Uh, come in. I'm very happy to see Mr. Cranston. I've heard a lot about him. How do you do? You say Carolyn is ill. She didn't mention it, it when I... It came on suddenly. She's been in a nervous condition lately, but it's mostly imaginary. I made her go to bed. Well, would it be all right if I saw I it? I suppose you... so. Go on up if you like. Well, thanks. I'll only be a few minutes, Lamar. Uh, what seems to be the trouble with your wife, Professor Sneed? Oh, she's run down, I guess. Frightfully nervous. She has some absurd notion that this place is, uh, well, haunted. Haunted? It's only the wind, of course, and the creaking of an old house. Mm. Ghosts. She keeps talking about ghosts. And I can't persuade her that there are no such things. Of course, old houses have a habit of getting themselves haunted, Professor. As for myself, I'm not so sure there aren't such things as ghosts. But surely, Mr. Cranston... Oh, not the conventional sort, perhaps, but... 
I mean people's spirits. Souls, whatever you want to call them. Haunting the places where they've been unhappy. Very interesting, I'm sure. But a lot of tosh. I put no stock in it. No? I'm just noticing that rather rare book on the table, Professor. Neuroses of death. What? Uh, if you're interested in that, I'm sure you must be interested in ghosts. I understand its morbid analysis of the factors of violent death are quite interesting. What do you know about it? Oh, I read all sorts of things, Professor. Professor Sneed. Oh, uh, yes, Miss Lane? Carolyn wants her sedative. Oh, yes, yes. I, I'll go up and give it to her. Did you find her comfortable, Miss Lane? Well, I... I think Carolyn is seriously ill. Yes, but more nerves than anything. Uh, excuse me uh, just a moment, won't you? Lamont, there's something wrong here. I was afraid there was. I, I, I don't know what it is, but it's something terrible. Well, what's the matter with Carolyn? Well, she hardly recognized me, and she talks like one in a trance. As though she were in the grip of some deadly fear. When I suggested sending the doctor over, she shook her head. But I'm going to just the same. I can't help feeling it's, it's that man, her husband. Yes, he isn't very pleasant, is he? His skin has an odd pallor. You see it on men who spent some time in prison. There are many little traits of his behavior that interest me as a, a psychologist. A remarkable man. But you don't know. I don't you. know. But I think we'll investigate this more or less formally, Margot. I'll visit the professor tomorrow at his office in town. If there are ghosts involved here, perhaps the shadow can bring them to light. <laughs> Yes, Carolyn. Well, don't worry, my dear. I'll leave the office here at five and I'll be home before six. Yes. Yes, I understand. Goodbye, dear. Well, who is it? Is that you, Miss White? Who's opening that door? Don't get up, Professor. I'll close it after me. What? I thought I might find you in. Who said that? Who are you? Your conscience speaking, Professor. Or have you a conscience? I'll show you what I've got. <laughs> Don't excite yourself. I'm only a voice. A voice they call... Professor, have you ever heard of the shadow? The shadow? Yes. You seem to have heard of me. What do you want? I've come to warn you, Sneed. Warn me? Warn me about what? I know what you're doing. What? And I know how it's going to end. The end is death. Death? I have something here I'll toss in your lap. There. Do you hear it? Why, you... Get out of here, I tell you. See it? Look, it's half of a playing card, the ace of spades. When you find the other half, that will be the end. Get out and leave me alone. All right, Sneed, I'll go, but don't forget. The shadow knows. <laughs> back, are you? Oh, it's you, Miss White. There are two gentlemen here to see you, Professor Sneed. Two gentlemen? Well, I'm not expecting... I guess you may remember us, Professor Sneed. Spike. Your old friend, Spike Collins, and Mr. Wilson here. Yes, uh, yes, of course. Uh, uh, please take those circulars on your desk, Miss White, and nail them at the post office right away. Yes, sir. Lock that door, right? Okay. And what are you staring at, Sneed? We ain't ghosts. Uh, I thought you two were doing a stretch at Leavenworth. Yeah, we were. But we framed a getaway. And now we come to see an old pal. Oh, now listen, Spike. I'd help you if I could. Not. But... We've been watching you and we know your game. We ain't got no time to stall. 
This old dame you married has got plenty of... I don't know what you're driving at. Well, you'll know if we squawk about that dame you married out in Idaho that croaked without anybody knowing what was the matter with her. Cards on the table, Sneed. Is this one signed our money over to you? Yes. She fixed her will in my favor. Well, what are you doing to get it? Well, she has a weak heart and... I know. Playing ghost and scaring her to death, eh? That's too slow, Sneed. I got a better scheme. We break into the house. State your burglary, see? In the scuffle, the old dame gets shot. Dead. It's quick. No, no. You can't do that. No. You'll see. Spike Collins. Spike Collins. Wake up. Spike Collins. What? Who's that? Just a voice, Colin. The voice of your own thoughts coming to warn you. No one but you can hear me. Your friend's need is going to double-cross you tonight. Need is going to double-cross you. It's your move. Be there to prevent him. Be there in time. Six o'clock. Be there. The Shadow will return in just a few moments. While we're waiting, ladies and gentlemen, I want to tell you about the ever-increasing popularity of Blue Coal, America's finest anthracite. Blue Coal is winning new friends every day among New England housewives. They not only like the superior heat of Blue Coal, but they find that it simplifies housekeeping. This is because Blue Coal is so clean. It burns completely and does not send any particles of unburned carbon through the house to be deposited on furniture or woodwork. The drudgery of daily cleaning is reduced to a minimum with this clean fuel. Blue Coal is the largest single brand of solid fuel prepared especially for home use. Each car is laboratory tested at the mines for purity and size before shipment. Blue coal is Pennsylvania's finest anthracite. So that you can personally identify this excellent fuel, it is actually colored blue at the mines. Order it by name. You will find the name of your nearest blue coal dealer listed in the where to buy it section of your classified telephone directory under the name Blue Coal. Are you comfortable in that chair, Carolyn? Yes, thank you, Margaret, dear. And I do appreciate your coming out here and staying with me. I'm glad to do it. But it's six o'clock. Your husband ought to be coming home pretty soon, shouldn't he? Uh, He phoned just before you got here and said he was starting. He seemed very agitated. Oh, he's a strange, unaccountable man sometimes. There are things about him I don't seem to understand. Yes, I know, dear. He has the car, I suppose? Yes, he's driving. He's probably on his way now. I've got to think. I've got to think of something. I know. We leave town. You're driving rather recklessly, Sneed. You again. I'm going to haunt you. Try to forget that I'm here in the rear seat. If it annoys you. No, don't look under the seat. If I could only see you, get my hands on you, I'd show you how much it annoys me. (laughs) Shut up. I'm the voice of your conscience, Mead. Perhaps you have a conscience. After all... I could choke that voice down your throat without any trouble to my conscience. If you only had the power of second sight, you could see me. That's an invaluable gift, Mead. Being able to see things that other men can't. Some people call it mental telepathy. Some by other names. Remember, 
I can see the pictures you make in your mind. I told you about that. You can warn all you like. That's not evidence. Not in court. A lot of wild guesses that don't mean anything. Well, doesn't it frighten you a little, Sneed? I simply will you not to see me, and you don't. Careful. There's a truck coming down the road. Better sound your horn. Good Lord, the fool's taking up the whole road. It's going to hit you. Look out. <laughs> it's gone. There wasn't any truck there. No. I willed you to see it. And you saw it. No truck at all. Just hypnotism. Gosh, I... I'm having hallucinations. But that's the way to dispel hallucinations. Drive straight through them. Be careful. We're near your house. And this old mill road is tricky. What about it? Look, Sneed. There's a man in the road ahead of you. There is, eh? Really? Why, it looks like one of your two pals that called on you today. I knew he would be here, Sneed. Really? You're going to hit him if you don't watch out. More of your hallucinations. You think that I'll believe you again, don't you? Well, I won't. Look out. I, I hit him. This time, it was no hallucination, Sneed. He was in front of you. <laughs> Hey, Asher. What's it all about, Lamont? Found dead on Old Mill Road. But that's up at the Saints' place. Yes, yes, I believe it is. Notorious criminal struck by automobile and killed. He was certainly struck by an automobile. I wonder if Sneed knew anything about it. He acted very strange when he got home last night. Strange? What way? Well, he was pale and shaky, and he hardly seemed to know I was there. He told Karen that he'd had a message from out of town, and they'd have to pack and leave. Oh, did he say when? Well, they thought they could get their trunks and things ready by this afternoon sometime. You're not going to let Carolyn go with him, Lamont? Not if I can help it. Let's see. A little after nine, I imagine Commissioner Weston is rather startled by the morning's news. I think I'll have a word... With Commissioner Weston. Commissioner Weston, I'm sending Collins' body into the morgue. Now, you went out there this morning and checked all details, Captain? Yes, sir, I did. And whoever hit him certainly smashed him up good. His face was all out of shape and couldn't recognize him. But we found these in his pocket. Well, let's see. Letter from his girl out west, looks like. Insurance policy. Uh, library card of Leavenworth Penitentiary. And this ring, sir, that Collins always wore with the figure eight on it. Oh, yes. Well, it's a good job done, whoever did it. Uh, tag that stuff and file it. Yes, sir. Let me know when the wagon gets here. Yes, sir. Police Department. Commissioner Weston speaking. Good morning, Commissioner. This is your good friend, the Shadow. Oh, yeah? Well, what the blazes do you want? To be of a little assistance, as usual. Yes, I see. I'm getting tired of this rigmarole, though heaven knows things happen when you phone. And what's the assistance today? Why didn't you investigate the ghost that haunts Sneed House, Commissioner, on the old mill road? Well, you missed up on that one, Mr. Shadow. I don't put much stock in ghosts. But we went out there and checked up. Searched the house. There's no evidence. No. Go again today, Commissioner. And this time, 
I think you'll get your evidence. <laughs> Is that the last drunk, Arthur? Yes. The expressman won't be here until four. Another hour yet. Why don't you go up and lie down a while, Caroline? Hmm? Yes, I will. I'll try to sleep a little now that it's daylight. You uh, told the milkman we wanted to pay him. He's coming back before we leave. Good. Well, that must be him now at the back door. <gasps> Get back. Get back. What's the matter, Snead? Did you see a ghost? Stop. Don't come near me. Not snap out of it, will you? This is me, Spike Collins. You? Alive? It wasn't me you hit with your car last night on that back road. I guess you wish it had been, huh? Who, who was it then? It was Rod Wilson. Fool got half pickled trying to get up his nerve for the job. I got out on the road before I could stop him, and wham. It was all over. Wilson, eh? So there was my chance, see? Him and me, about the same size, his face and hands all smashed flat. I put my stuff in his pockets, my ring on what was left of his finger. There I was, dead. <laughs> and all that time you was giving me the double cross. And maybe I am a ghost. But I can still deal with you, Sneed. Who is it, Arthur? Uh, just a minute, Carolyn. Now listen, Spike. There's only one way to see this thing through. You and I have got to stick together. The shadow is after us both. We've got to get out together. Away from this, this yeah. shadow. Don't kid me anymore about the shadow. You see this cat? Mm. I'm here on business and I'm going through with it. Put the old lady out of her misery. Good Lord. What's the matter? There, on the table. That hmm. been a torn playing card. Yes, of spades, or half of it. You've got to stop it, Spike. You've got to stop it. Arthur, what's the matter? Who's this man? Uh, Carolyn, this, uh, this is a friend of mine. A friend? Sure, a friend. But I don't understand. The pistol, I... Yeah, that's my way of doing business, lady. Your husband does it differently. He's been scaring you to death, ain't he? Making you think the place was haunted. You know how he always does it? Stop it, Spike. He used to be an electrician, see? He rigs up a sort of electric sound box with a remote control switch. He usually puts the switch over here by the door. Yeah, here it is. What's it all about, Arthur? The Ace of Spades. The end. Death. When he turns the switch, you hear the ghost dance. All you have to do is turn this knob. That's the way it works, lady. But I hear it. Arthur, I hear it. Turn that thing off, you idiot. What? I, I haven't turned it on. You haven't. And, and what's making those sounds? <laughs> I am. Um... What's that? It's him. He's come. A shadow. I am coming up these cellar stairs. I will enter and stand beside you. Where is he? Stand back or I'll shoot. When I enter, I will touch one of you on the shoulder. Stop him. Stop him. And that one will die. Open up in there. Where's the cops? Come here, Steve. It's a plant. You call in the cops. No, don't shoot, Spike. The jig is up. You can have the bullet I was going to give your wife, you double-crossing skunk. Oh, you killed him. Come on, here we are. Go through that side room, boys. Okay. Stick him up. Stay on I got him. I'll stand still around. Break your arm. Now, hand over that gat. All right. I'm through. You win. Spike Collins. Spike by Collins. Well, I, I thought he was... He's a fool. I thought you... Say, what is this? Who was that guy that got killed over here last night? Come clean, Collins. Whoever it was, I didn't do it. 
<laughs> Who's that? Where are you? Don't be alarmed. I am here behind you. In the shadow. Oh. So you're here, Shadow, eh? Maybe you know who got killed here last night. The man killed last night, Commissioner, is a ghost. Oh, yeah? There are now two ghosts in this little adventure. Mr. Collins will probably make the third. You really should believe in ghosts now, Commissioner. And in shadows. <laughs> And now, before today's adventure with the shadow comes to a close, John Barkley, Blue Coal's own heating expert, is here to give us another of his practical talks on automatic heating. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Barkley. Good evening, friends. In former Sunday night talks of mine, I've shown you the importance of having the temperature of the home properly controlled with the Blue Coal automatic heat regulator. That is, in terms of health and convenience. Now, tonight, I'm going to give a third important reason for automatic heating, economy. Most authorities will tell you that the proper degree of heat in the home is 70 degrees. Naturally, you can't by hand keep your fire from giving off more than 70 degrees of heat, but the blue coal automatic heat regulator can and does. But here's how that saves you actual fuel dollars. Heating engineers have discovered that for every degree you raise the temperature above the desired 70 degrees, your fuel goes up in cost one and one-half percent. So you see, friends, by automatically shutting off that heat, that extra wasteful, unhealthy heat, heat regulator automatically saves on fuel costs. Why not investigate this blue coal heat regulator further? Ask your local blue coal dealer to give you a demonstration. The cost is only $18.95 plus a small charge for installation. You'll find it well worth every cent of that and more. Moreover, if you have any heating problems, discuss these also with your blue coal dealer. He is the best informed heating authority in your community and assisted by his John Barkley trained serviceman can, I'm sure, help you save money and have a more comfortable home this winter. This service is free. It costs you nothing. Thank you. The Shadow Adventure you have just heard is copyrighted by The Shadow Magazine. The characters in this story are entirely fictitious. Any similarity to persons living or dead is purely coincidental. The weed of crime bears bitter fruit. Crime does not pay. The shadow knows. Sir Arthur Whiteside. While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, to visit sponsors you hear about during the show, sign up for my newsletter, enter contests, connect with me on social media, hear other podcasts that I host listen to free audiobooks I've narrated. Plus, you can visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com.
nestled in a quiet neighborhood near Hickory Hill Park, is Iowa City's Oakland Cemetery. The burial ground is home to numerous monuments to the dead, including one striking statue with a dark reputation, the Bronze Black Angel. The figure dates back to the early 20th century and stands watch over the graves of Teresa Dolezal and her family. Teresa moved to Iowa City with her son Eddie in the late 1800s. There she worked as a midwife until 1891 when Eddie contracted meningitis and died. The boy's body was buried in Oakland Cemetery and a monument carved in the shape of a tree stump was erected to mark his grave. After Eddie's death, Teresa moved to Oregon where she met and married Nicholas Feldevert. But Feldevert was not long in this world either. He died only a few years later, in 1911. Stricken by two losses so close together, Teresa returned to Iowa City and commissioned the construction of an eight-and-a-half-foot-tall bronze angel from Chicago artist Mario Corbell to memorialize her loved ones. As soon as the statue arrived by train car, stories began to circulate. When the statue was erected in 1913, Eddie's monument was moved to stand beside it, while the ashes of Nicholas Feldevert were placed within the statue's base. When Teresa Feldevert herself passed away in 1924, her ashes joined those of her late husband. Curiously, no death date was added to Teresa's name at the base, fueling the statue's mystery. What's more, the Black Angel statue has turned from bronze to black by the time of Teresa's death. Local legends sprang up to explain this phenomenon, with most centering on Teresa's passing. Some claimed that she was an evil, mysterious woman and that the statue changed its colors to warn others to stay away from her grave. One particularly dramatic telling told of a thunderstorm on the night of Teresa's funeral. A lightning bolt struck the angel statue, scorching it black. Other versions blamed the blackening of the statue on infidelity, claiming that Teresa swore on her husband's grave to remain faithful until her death and that the monument would turn black if she didn't keep her vow. Some even claimed that Eddie Dolezal never died of meningitis but was murdered by Teresa herself, the angel statue blackened as a mark of her guilt. Little proof exists to corroborate any such claims, and many explain the color change as the natural process of oxidation. Still, the legends persist, with some asserting that the angel's eyes had turned black as coal overnight and the blackness then spread down its face as though the angel was weeping. With such a reputation, it's no wonder the Black Angel statue is now said to possess sinister powers. According to one tale, any girl kissed in the shadow of the angel's wings will die within six months, and anyone who touches the angel on Halloween night will die in seven years. Kissing the angel directly, meanwhile, will cause a person's heart to stop instantly. One variation states that only a virgin can survive touching or kissing the statue without being struck dead. Another claims that the angel itself gets down from its pedestal and walks the cemetery at night. In 2013, the Sci-Fi Channel series Haunted Highway visited Oakland Cemetery to do an episode on The Black Angel, which aired on December 18th. Investigators captured odd sounds and visual anomalies throughout the cemetery. When they turned their thermal cameras onto the Black Angel statue, they found that it showed up as glowing hot, even though the night around it was chilly. Whatever the truth of the many legends, there's no doubting the Black Angel's power as a monument. Pretty much anyone who grew up in Kansas, including yours truly, or if you watch the show Supernatural, you know about Stull Cemetery, even if you've never seen it personally. According to legend, this cemetery contains a stairway, not to heaven, but straight to hell. It's one of seven reputed places on Earth where living people can descend to the realm of the damned. 
The staircase is said to appear only once a year. Suddenly, a hidden staircase is revealed, descending into a grave, then into the underworld. Most versions of the story say it happens on the stroke of midnight on Halloween. Others say the stairway to hell opens on the spring equinox. So if you ever find these stairs, you must never go down them, because you will never come back. From there, the tales vary, with accounts claiming that Satan himself comes forth on Halloween night to hold court in the cursed cemetery. In some versions, Satan comes to visit the grave of his infant son, while others maintain that it is the grave of a witch that the Prince of Darkness visits, who was the mother of his son, who also appears on the scene as a werewolf. Many of the legends surrounding Stull Cemetery center on an old stone church that stood there from 1867 until 2002. The Evangelical Emanuel Church was built by the town's original Pennsylvania Dutch settlers, who held their services in German until 1908. Then the church sat empty for much of the 20th century, its roof falling in, walls beginning to crumble, even as strange stories clustered tight around it. The church is said to have been used by Satanists, witches, and cults for their rituals. Though it had no roof by the time these groups supposedly convened there, it was said that rain would never fall within its walls. Other accounts claimed that it was impossible to break a glass bottle inside the church. Next to the church was a tall pine tree which grew up through and split a headstone. According to stories, the tree was used to hang witches before the land was consecrated as a churchyard. The church and the tree were often held to be signposts, helping to point the way to the gate of hell. In 1998, on the day before Halloween, the tree was cut down in order to dissuade thrill-seekers. Stull's status as the location of one of the gateways of hell is so well-known that it inspired an album by the band Urge Overkill, featuring images of Stull Cemetery on the album cover. It was also used in the plots of several movies, including the machinations of the satanic villains in Turbulence 3, who planned to crash a plane into Stull Cemetery in order to release Satan. The film also makes use of an urban legend that when the Pope visited Colorado in 1995, he diverted his plane around Kansas so as not to fly over on hollowed ground. In the final episode of the fifth season of the TV series Supernatural, the final confrontation of the apocalypse takes place in Stull Cemetery, though it is actually filmed in Vancouver. Depictions like these have done nothing to dissuade amateur ghost hunters thrill-seekers, and legend-trippers from descending upon Stull Cemetery, especially on Halloween night. In spite of fences, no trespassing signs, and the fact that the area is heavily patrolled by police, the residents of the small community of Stull have had to deal with countless instances of trespassing and vandalism. In 1978, more than 150 people attempted to go to the cemetery on Halloween night. In 1988, that number climbed to nearly 500. The cemetery today is home to as many broken headstones as ones that are still intact, and many of the markers are gone completely, spirited off by vandals who wanted a piece of the famously accursed burying place. Stories about Stull often claim that it is guarded by mysterious people in pickup trucks who terrorize visitors. Those stories, at least, are almost certainly true, though perhaps less mysterious than they might appear. The living residents of Stull aren't exactly thrilled by the cemetery's diabolical reputation and the often less-than-respectful tourists, so residents frequently aid the police in patrolling the area in pickup trucks. Tracing the origins of the stories about Stull is no easy matter, though. The area has had its share of odd deaths over the years, including a boy who was accidentally burned to death and a man who was found hanging in a tree. Yet according to the Committee for Skeptical Inquiry, Stull Cemetery's reputation as one of the seven gateways to hell can be traced back to a professor at the nearby University of Kansas who made it up as an urban legend to tell his students. As the story spread, it took on a life of its own until it was printed in the university paper in the 1970s. 
Whatever the origins of the diabolical legends, most people who still live in the community today and have ancestors buried in the old churchyard just want to see them rest in peace. Barbados may be known as a popular tourist destination, but local culture and history involve more than just white sand beaches and fruity mixed drinks. In the center of the island is Christ Parish Church, whose graveyard, like many graveyards, has a few ghost stories. One particular tale involves a family's tragic saga and a legacy of post-mortem unrest. In 1808, the Chase family purchased the vault for the burial of their child, an infant by the name of Mary Ann Maria. Some claim her name was Anne Marie or Mary Ann Maria. The tomb had been built in 1724 and already held the body of Miss Thomasina Goddard, buried in 1807. Colonel Thomas Chase, patriarch of the family, decided against disturbing the deceased by moving her coffin out of his new family vault. For years after they buried their baby, the Chases had to bury another child, their daughter Dorcas. The circumstances surrounding her death were more than slightly unusual. The young girl starved herself to death, apparently as an act of rebellion against her father Thomas, who was supposedly abusing her. The girl's body was buried beside her infant sisters, each small body held in lead caskets. Just one month after burying Dorcas, Thomas Chase himself died. Strangely, his death was also a suicide. The family prepared Thomas's body and opened the Chase vault, but what they claimed to find inside was shocking. Where there had previously been three coffins lined neatly in a row, the tomb was now a scattered mess, with each casket upended and in a different place. The coffins themselves seemed to have been moved, the Chase family was shocked, but they chalked up the scene to grave robbers. The coffins were once again arranged neatly, and Thomas's casket, made of lead just as his daughter's had been and weighing nearly 240 pounds, was added. The massive marble stone was rolled back into place, taking several men to do so, and the entrance was sealed. The next death in the family was Charles Brewster Ames in 1816. Again, the eleven-year-old's body was prepared for burial and the chase vault was opened. The invasion of 1812 seemed to have happened again. All four coffins, including Thomas's tremendously heavy one, were displaced, as if they'd been tossed like toys, and yet the entrance had not been tampered with. Once again, the coffins were returned to their original place and the tomb was resealed. It was around this time that the public began to take interest in the stories that were being told of the moving coffins. Twice more, in 1816 and in 1819, the tomb was reopened to add the coffin of a family member, and both times the vault was said to have been rearranged from within. It seemed that the dead really were not at rest. Secondary stories of hearing shrieks from within the tomb or of horses being spooked while passing it also became more and more prevalent. The governor of Barbados himself even took interest in the case. He ordered an inspection of the Chase Vault, inside and out, and after being satisfied that it was secure, had a fine dust sprinkled on the floor and his own signet ring stamped into the seal on the door. Eight months later, he returned. Externally, everything was in order and the seal was intact. Curiosity called for the door to be opened, at which point onlookers saw to their horror that the coffins, once again, had been thrown about inside the chamber. This time, the movement seemed to be quite violent, with Mary Ann's coffin thrown so forcefully into a wall that the corner of her casket had broken off. This was the last time the vault was reopened. Each coffin was individually buried hoping to restore some peace to the individuals whose bodies were inside. The tomb itself remains empty today and open with nothing but stories passing through. Although the story has circulated for over 200 years, researchers call it historically dubious. 
No burial records or newspaper articles exist to confirm the tale as it allegedly happened, and certain details of the event echo a Freemason allegory of secret vaults and restless coffins. However, there was a Chase family living in Barbados at the time, and others who swear by the facts of the tale. Whether or not it can be known for certain, it seems telling that the tomb has remained open, that the Chase family bodies have remained separated, specifically those of Dorcas and her father Thomas, and no mysterious movement has since happened. Where Darkness continues with more true stories of haunted cemeteries, graveyards, and mausoleums, up next. Sometimes you feel a bit nutty, especially if you're a weirdo. If that feeling transfers to your taste buds as well, I've got some great news for you. Weird Dark Roast Nutty Mummy Coffee. Wrap your taste buds around this medium dark roast blend with shrouds of almond, honey, and chocolate. Each bag of Nutty Mummy is exclusive to Weird Darkness and is roasted to order, then bandaged, I mean bagged, specifically for you to ensure maximum freshness for you, your mummy, and anyone else you share it with. Entomb your old coffee and bring your taste buds back from the dead with Weird Dark Roast Nutty Mummy at WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. Call while I was out, Rosie? No, sir. Good. Maybe my luck's in tonight. About time I had a peaceful evening at home. Oh, Lord. I spoke too soon. See what it is this time, Rosie? Croup or tonsils? Yes, sir. Certainly, sir. No more privacy than a Siamese twin. Doctor can't call his soul his own. As, uh, yes, Rosie? What is it? What do you think he has? He's trying to patient, sir. No? What then? I don't rightly know, sir. He's an old fellow with, with white whiskers like a billy goat, sir. Oh, dear. He said to tell you it was your, your Bible fool calling, sir. My what? Oh, 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 the bibliophile. Yes, sir. He's your, your surprise to see me so soon, eh? Well, how do you do? Come in, come in. I'd like to see you. That's all right, isn't it? Yes, sir. Yeah, sit down, won't you? I hope you recovered from that bump I gave you. Yes, uh, that's what I came to see you about, uh, Dr. Watson. Uh, I've got a conscience, sir. And when I chanced to see you come into this house, I came wobbling up to you. Because I said to myself, I'll, I'll just step in and see you that kind gentleman and tell him I'm sorry I was a bit gruff a while back. No harm in. Not much obliged for offering to pick up my book. Oh, not at all, by no means. Uh, maybe you collect books yourself, eh? Well, no, I can't say I do. Well, it's never too late to learn. Now, now, here, here's a copy of British Birds, and, and here's a very fine catullus. Maybe this holy war would be more in your line. No, really, I'm sorry. I don't think I... A bargain, will. every one of them. Well, there's five volumes. You you could just fill that gap on the second shelf. <laughs> so untidy, my dear Watson. Quite unlike your old self. Oh, Holmes! <laughs> Obviously. I wondered how long it would take you to penetrate my disguise. Then you're not... You're not dead. Your reasoning as usual, my dear Watson, is faultless. Well, well I... I... Oh, for heaven's sake. Easy, hey. easy, Watson, easy. My easy. dear Holmes, my dear old... I think I, I now sit down. It's a good idea, good idea. But better have a nip of this brandy. Mm, yes, I could do with a bit of a bracer. My dear Watson, a thousand apologies. I had no idea you'd be so affected. Well, I'm not made of chill steel like yourself, Holmes. Where's my brandy? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Here you are. Here you are. Uh, that's better. Oh. So it's really you standing here in my study. Well, thank heaven, you old reprobate. 
How in heaven's name did you ever come back alive out of that dreadful chasm where Professor Moriarty met his death? It's quite simple. I was never there. Yes, but good heavens, Holmes, why, it's been three years. You let us believe you were dead all that time. Was that nice? Not nice, Watson, but necessary. You see, Moriarty's gang was still to be dealt with. I was much safer if they believed I had met my death at the same time as their illustrious leader. For three years, I've been living in disguise, tracking the members of that foul brotherhood, the ends of the earth. Now I'm happy to say there's only one left to be dealt with. Well, hang it all, Holmes. Why didn't you let me know who you were when I bumped into you in Park Lane just now? Because, my dear Watson, you are being watched by the man I'm after. The last of Moriarty's gang. Good heaven. Why, who is he? Someone you doubtless know, Watson. You may even have played whist with him on numerous occasions and lost. You know, most people lose when they play with the tiger, as Moriarty used to call him. A clever man, Watson, very clever. Not only suspects that I'm alive, he even guesses that I've returned to London. Oh, good Lord. Yes, yes, but I mean to take advantage of this cleverness. I've set a trap for him. I expect to catch my tiger tonight. Tonight? Exactly. I don't suppose you'd care to come along. Well, you just tried to prevent me. That's all I have to say here. Just a minute now till I get my hat and stick. Uh, I think you'll find your army revolver a little more appropriate, Watson. <laughs> have to do all this pussyfooting down dark mews and through smelly stables. Absolutely, my dear Watson, absolutely. Like it's essential that we should not be followed at this stage of the game. Hmm. We've passed Manchester Street and Blanford Street. Oh, yes, yes, here, here. Now, down this narrow passage. Oh, good Lord, why, it's as dark as the black hole of Calcutta. Yeah, yeah. Now, here, here, scale this fence. What? Scale the fence? Oh, don't tell me you've let yourself get out of condition during my absence. No, I certainly not. I mean, do you think it's quite dignified? Huh? <laughs> Probably not, but who will ever know? All right, come on, up with you. Up with you. Wait, up, 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 up ahead. Oh, 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 I say, I've ruined the knees of my trousers. Oh, stop They're babbling, what? Stop babbling and come all. along. You've got to get into this house. But look here, it's an empty house. Quiet, that's why I selected it. Oh, now, where did I put that key? <laughs> well, don't tell me you're not going to pick the lock, Holmes. You're losing your grip, you Quiet. know. Uh, come in. Easy, does it? I shut the door after you gently, my dear Watson. Gently, gently. Well, I'm doing my best. That is a draft. Now what? I'll come along upstairs. Hmm. We should get a good view from the windows of the front room. You no, know, home. There's something spooky about an empty house. Strange noises and boards squeaking. Easy, easy. Turn the corner here. Are you with me? Oh, yes, absolutely. Mm. Absolutely. Ah, this is the room. Excellent. The light from the street lamp is all the illumination we shall need. Say, Holmes, there's something familiar about that street out there. It, why, of course it, it's Baker Street. <laughs> exactly. We are in Camden House, which stands opposite our old quarter. By Jove, I no wonder it looks familiar. Well, why station ourselves here? Because it commands an excellent view of our historic dwelling. And might I trouble you, my dear Watson, to draw a little nearer to the window, mm -hmm. taking every precaution not to show yourself. And then look up at our old rooms. You'll see if three years of absence have entirely taken away my power to surprise you. Well, I... The windows of our sitting room are lighted. Say, there's a man sitting in front of one. Why, look, look... It's you. Uh, well, at, at least it's your silhouette. Yes, it's the bust of me, to be exact. Well, anything else of interest in Baker Street? Okay. Mm, Two disreputable-looking fellows leaning against the lamppost. Excellent, excellent. It's all right, Watson. I expected them. Holmes, good heavens, your head. I, I mean, I mean, the dummy. Why, it moved. Well, of course, of course. Our old friend Mrs. Hudson had ordered to move it from below from time to time. What's that? Sounded like a door opening. Yes, yes, I thought it round. By all that's holy, he's going to operate from inside the building. Mm, I expect he'd work in the street as he did before. Quick, Watson, quick. We've got to get out of here. He'll probably want this window. Mm, me, he's coming in here. Of course, of course. Quick, Watson, quick, into the next room. Here, here. Stand in the shadow. Where we can watch him without being seen. Shiny footsteps. Quiet, quiet, quiet. Come in, Betty. Your light. 
standing in the doorway. The face is in the shadow of his hat. Great God, his eyes blaze in the dark like a cat's, like a tiger's, Watson. He's crossing to the window. Oh, he's raising the window. Not very far, Watson. That won't be necessary. His stick, his walking stick. Why is he pointing it out of the window? It's a gun, a blowgun, Watson. Devilish invention. Doesn't make a sound. He's going to take a shot at my silhouette. And when we hear the window across the street crash, we'll know he's fired. Oh, look, he's aiming. Get him, get him, Watson, get him. Where, Watson, I got him. Don't you move. Look out, Watson, look out. Uh, Watch your head, yeah. Not before I take the life out of you. Oh, no, you don't. Oh. Oh, Watson, Watson, are you all right? I've knocked him out. Yes, <coughs> Oh, I, what, what, what's that for? The two men from Scotland Yard leaning against the lamppost outside. I must say, I thought our friend here would do his dirty work outside so they could deal with him firsthand. Ah, well, here come the regulars. Well, 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 if it isn't the Strad. Oh, you bet it is. Took it down myself. Maybe we weren't glad to get your message to Scotland Yard half an hour ago. Although, I must say, we've done pretty well down there in your absence. Really? Solved the Ronald Adair mystery yet? Well, that is... Uh... Oh. Oh. <laughs> Our sleeping duty seems to be coming too. Uh, Gentlemen, allow me to present Colonel Sebastian Moran, late of Her Majesty's Indian Army. Uh, I believe I'm correct, Colonel, in saying that your bag of tigers still remains unrivaled. You gotta believe this. Yeah, it's a remarkable shot. You and your blowgun were invaluable to the late Professor Moriarty, eh? I might have known that wasn't you in the window. Quite. I'm surprised such a simple stratagem could deceive so old a shikari. What do you mean, man? How often, Colonel, have you tethered a goat to a tree, lain above it with your rifle, and waited for the bait to attract your tiger? Now, this empty house is my tree. You were the tiger. The only difference being that <laughs> I, I didn't care to be the goat myself. <laughs> well, take him away, Lestrade. Take him away. Just a minute. You can't arrest me for taking a shot at a dummy. Not even the dummy of Sherlock Holmes. Quite right. I arrest you for the murder of the Honorable Ronald Adair. Huh? Because you are the only man alive capable of shooting a man through the slightly open window from the street below without being heard. Uh, yeah, it's a truly remarkable shot, Colonel. A bit too remarkable. <laughs> That's how I knew you were the murderer. Come along, you. Come yeah, on. Right. Yes, bring this thing along. Take us up. We're the visitors. Come, come on. Come on. Come on. Yeah. Well, Watson. Hmm. Yeah. Now, what do you say? Shall we step across the street to our old quarter? I think you'll find everything just as it used to be. And I'm sure Mrs. Hudson is anxiously awaiting us with sandwiches and a steaming hot pot of coffee. <laughs> yes, you see, I remember your your weakness. My weakness? Oh, I like that. <laughs> That, Mr. Bell, is the story of how I went back to live in Baker Street and started another series of incredible and amazing adventures which I shall tell you about this winter. Well, that's certainly a promising outlook, Dr. Watson. There's just one thing I don't understand about tonight's story, though. Why did Colonel Moran kill Ronald Adair? Because Adair had discovered Moran was cheating at cards and threatened to expose him. Oh. You remember... I said Adair had won 400 pounds at whist the week before with Moran as his partner. Yes. Now, that amount made Adair suspicious. He discovered the cards were marked. The very cards, by the way, which were found beside the dead body. He was examining them again to be sure he'd made no mistake. That's why the door was locked on the inside. Didn't want anyone to interrupt him. But I say, wouldn't you like another cup of coffee? I never say no to G. Washington. By the way... Didn't you find it a comfort in your travels this summer? Comfort? My dear man, G. Washington's was indispensable. Perfect coffee on ship, boys. Pretty unusual, you know. Yes, but with G. Washington's, you were always sure of getting it. No danger of it losing its freshness even in the salt air. No, and the most inexperienced person can't spoil it in the making. That's right. The difficult part, the brewing, has been done at the refinery beforehand. You get just the pure coffee crystals without any useless bulky ground. Precisely. Oh, Mr. Bell, while I'm making our second cup, why don't you tell our listeners that I'd feel particularly honored if they'd join us, sort of celebrate the beginning of my third season on the air, don't you know? Indeed, I will, Dr. Watson. Ladies and gentlemen, won't you start this series of Dr. Watson's storytelling hours by joining us in our little coffee-drinking ritual? 
We know that many of you are regular users of G. Washington's coffee, and in order that the newcomers to our circle of listeners may also learn its convenience and excellent flavor firsthand, we invite you to try it at our expense. Just send your name and address to G. Washington, Morristown, New Jersey, and you will receive enough to make three delicious cupfuls. Remember the address, Morristown, New Jersey. Canadians should write to the Grocer's Specialty Company, Montreal, Canada. And when you write, please tell us what station you are listening to. If you wish to try it immediately, why, order a can from your grocer first thing tomorrow morning. It's economical because there's never any wait. Now, Dr. Watson, what story are we to have next week? Well, suppose I tell you why England was not invaded during the first week of the World War. Now, that sounds exciting. Did Holmes have anything to do with that? Did he? He was entirely responsible, that's all. Entirely responsible. In 2025, neutron bombs wipe out much of the world's drinkable water. For the next several years, survivors exist in deplorable conditions and their rations are dwindling. One woman arises from the camp, determined to improve conditions. Charlotte is ready to do whatever it takes to ensure clean water for her fellow survivors. Water is almighty. Whoever controls the water rules the world. Can Charlotte prevent the power from falling into the wrong hands? Weird Darkness Publishing presents Working for H2O by Sarah Faith, now available in paperback, Kindle, and audiobook versions on Amazon and at WeirdDarkness.com. Cemeteries everywhere are considered haunted for many reasons, including grave robbery, unmarked or forgotten burials, natural disasters that disturb resting places, or sometimes even because the deceased was not properly buried at all. Add all of that to the fact that graveyards are often dark, somber places, and you've got the perfect setting for a ghost, or two, or several let's explore some of the world's most haunted cemeteries that we have yet to touch on. But don't forget to hold your breath as you drive by these places, or you might breathe in the spirit of someone who has recently died. Pinewood Historic Cemetery, Coral Gables, Florida According to legend, an elderly woman's grave was vandalized by teenagers, and now she roams the graveyard scaring folks, minus her head. Rookwood Cemetery, Sydney, Australia. Close to one million people lie in the beautiful Victorian Rockwood Cemetery in Sydney, but it is the grave of the notorious Davenport Brothers, famous spiritualists, that is said to attract ghosts to the necropolis. Western Burial Ground, Maryland. This graveyard in Baltimore has one thing going for it already. It's the final resting place of horror writer and poet Edgar Allan Poe. If that doesn't give you chills, maybe some of the stories will. This cemetery has an unfortunate history of live burials. Many spirits are said to haunt the ground, looking for revenge on those who buried them prematurely. There's even tales of a buried skull placed there to block out the sound of screams that seem to be coming from the severed head of a former minister. Many have claimed to hear the sound of screams 
and some even claim it caused detrimental effects to their mental health. God's Acre Cemetery, Bethany, West Virginia The cemetery is said to be occupied by multiple spirits. Built in the 1820s, the cemetery later had a stone wall erected around it that has no breaks. The wall extends four feet up and goes another three feet underground. The rumor is that the wall was built that way to try and keep all of the restless spirits trapped in the cemetery walls. Savannah, Georgia is a town with a whole lot of character and a whole lot of ghosts. As the city expanded over the years, many old burial grounds were covered up, paved over and built upon, often without moving the graves that lay beneath. This has led Savannah to gain the nickname the city that lives upon her dead, and it's also led to plenty of ghostly tales and spectral sightings all over the city. Ask any local and many will tell you the most haunted place in all of Savannah is the Colonial Park Cemetery. The oldest extant burial ground in the city, the Colonial Park Cemetery lies right in the middle of the town's famed historic district, on the corners of Abercorn and Oglethorpe Streets. The Six Acre Cemetery was founded in 1750 and acted as the city's primary burial ground until 1853. More than 10,000 people are estimated to be buried in Colonial Park, though the cemetery is home to fewer than 1,000 grave markers. Roughly 700 of the cemetery's permanent residents lie in a mass grave, victims of the yellow fever epidemic of 1820. Some stories say that the dead actually number exactly 666, but the figure was rounded up to nearly 700 to avoid association with the number of the beast. Many of the dead are interred in the brick family burial vaults for which the cemetery is famous. These vaults, which were once underground structures that have been compared to root cellars, held the bodies of deceased family members on shelves. When time and the savanna climate reduced the corpses to little more than bones and dust, the remains were transferred into a large family urn and the shelf reused for the next family member in line. During the Civil War, General Sherman's Union Army spared Savannah from complete destruction in his march to the sea, presenting the city to President Abraham Lincoln as a Christmas gift in 1864. However, members of the Union Army did desecrate and vandalize the tombs in Colonial Park Cemetery, often in strange and creative ways. These included moving headstones around and carving new dates on the tombstones with their bayonets. One man had his death date changed to indicate that he lived to the ripe old age of 544 years, while the vandals changed the dates on another stone to show that a man's son had been born 1,000 years before his father. Over the years, the boundaries of Colonial Park Cemetery have shifted, and there are some who claim that the dead are interred beneath the streets that border the cemetery. In the 1960s, workers doing construction on Abercorn Street supposedly found human bodies. Some point to the pattern of rises and depressions in the sidewalk that borders the street as evidence of wooden coffins beneath. Of course, any place with such a rich history of death and burial is bound to be home to more than a few ghost stories, and Colonial Park Cemetery is no exception. Some such stories concern the dueling grounds that were said to lie just beyond the south wall of the cemetery. Back when dueling was still legal, this was where gentlemen came to resolve their differences, often permanently. Today, the grounds are home to a basketball court and a children's playground, but some say that if you travel by at night, you'll see the ghosts of those who died in duels. One of the most famous ghost stories associated with the Colonial Park Cemetery concerns a man named René Rondolier. Rondolier's ghost has often been reported walking through the cemetery or hanging from the hanging tree which lies near the back wall of the grounds. Rondolier's ghost is said to be easy to spot because in life he was almost seven feet tall. The story goes that he murdered two young girls in the cemetery and was later lynched, 
either from the hanging tree or in the nearby square. Though there is little historical evidence to corroborate Rondelier's existence, in life, let alone in death, plenty of visitors to the cemetery report strange occurrences within the cemetery grounds. There are tales of shadowy figures and even a green mist moving among the remaining headstones. Colonial Park Cemetery is considered so haunted, in fact, that local paranormal investigators have taken to calling the graveyard Paranormal Central. Of course, upon your visit, you can schedule a ghost tour. New York City certainly has its fair share of hidden spots. From the abandoned buildings on dead-end streets to colonial relics from the not-so-distant past. But along the northern coast of the Big Apple lies a small island with a dark and troubled history. Hart Island, located in the Long Island Sound just off the coast of the Bronx, is little known to city residents. Over the years, it has functioned as a Civil War prison camp, a sanatorium, and most infamously as an immense burial ground for the city's unknown dead. But just what is the story behind this mile-long sliver of land? Thomas Pell, a physician from England, came to the New World and purchased a substantial amount of land from the native inhabitants in what is now the Bronx and Westchester County. The year was 1654, and Hart Island was included in Pell's purchase from Chief Wampage of the Sewanee people. The exact amount Pell paid for the land is unknown, though some rumors state it was nothing more than a cask of rum. During the Civil War, the island functioned as a prisoner of war camp for the Union Army. Just over 3,000 Confederate soldiers were jailed there, some dying during their stay. In 1869, the city of New York purchased the island for $75,000, transforming it into a potter's field for the city's growing burial demands. The first person to be interred on Hart Island was a 24-year-old woman named Louisa Van Slyke, who died in 1869 with no family or friends to claim her body. Initially, unknowns were buried in single plots, but as more and more bodies were shipped ashore, cemetery workers soon ran out of space. Consequently, the city started burying people in mass graves, long trenches that each held 48 bodies, one on top of the other. Children and infants were buried in troughs that held up to a thousand bodies. It wasn't long before the site became the largest tax-funded cemetery in the world. In addition to providing burial grounds for the outcast dead of the five boroughs, Hart Island also served as a quarantine site during a yellow fever outbreak in 1870 and was a convalescent hospital for tuberculosis patients. A labor center for delinquent boys was also established on its shores. In the late 19th century, Hart Island supplied overflow housing for female patients from the Blackwell Island Insane Asylum on what is now Roosevelt Island, receiving only the most chronic cases. Later, the outpost transformed into the Phoenix House, a drug rehabilitation center whose residents were tasked with fashioning leather shoes. Scraps of old leather still litter the island to this day. By 1977, Following the closure of Phoenix House, the island was vandalized and nearly all of its burial records were lost in a fire. But that did not deter New York City from continuing to use the island as a burial site. Over one million people have been interred on Hart Island since it first started as a potter's field. All of the graves are unmarked, with the exception of one. That plot belongs to the first child to die of AIDS in New York, who was buried in isolation with no name. Today, the cemetery is a resting place for the indigent and for those whose families simply cannot afford to pay for a proper funeral. Inmates from nearby's Rikers Island perform the burials. The isolated nature of Hart Island has made it exceedingly difficult for the bereaved to pay their respects. Historically, grieving friends and family have been forbidden from setting foot on the island. It was not until July 2015 that the city government announced it would facilitate visits by family members, 
following the settlement of a class-action civil liberties lawsuit. Finally, some life will wash ashore on Hart Island. I'm a man of habits. Okay, truth be told, my bride says I'm boring. I like the same stuff, and that's what I stick with, and that includes what I eat. Even for breakfast, I used to opt for leftover pizza, hot dogs, hamburgers. Uh, did, did I mention pizza? Anyway, now that I'm trying to lose weight and cut back on the carbs, I've had to make changes for breakfast. Now, instead of a big, heavy breakfast, I just grab one of my Built Bars, the best-tasting protein bar on the planet. Built Bars satisfy my hunger with up to 19 grams of protein and also satisfy my sugar craving, despite being less than 3 grams of sugar. And at only about 150 calories per bar, if I'm really hungry in the morning, I can grab two of them and still feel good about it. Try replacing your dessert, or even a meal like breakfast, with a Built Bar. You won't even know it's not really a candy bar. Visit WeirdDarkness.com Built and build a box of your own. Use the promo code WeirdDarkness at checkout and get 10% off your entire purchase. That's WeirdDarkness.com Built, promo code WeirdDarkness. This is Nelson Olmstead. Sleep no more. Sleep no more. Turn down the lights. Sink back in your chair and don't look into the shadows. In the shadows, there may be moving things. Tonight, it may be, you will sleep no more. Good evening. This is Ben Grauer introducing tonight's tale of terror. Told by Nelson Armstead on the National Broadcasting Company's presentation of Sleep no more. The story of terror can be as simple as a sheeted ghost rattling chains. It can be a complex and hidden world of horror, lurking in such unholy dimensions as only the dead and the moonstruck can glimpse. Or it can be those terrible, fathomless shadows which lie buried deep in the primitive mind of civilized man. And for this evening... Well, Nelson Olmstead, tell us about this evening's story. The story tonight, Ben, is one of the strangest adventures you've ever heard. The tale of a Navy flyer marooned on a small Pacific island. It's called Conqueror's Isle by that master of suspense, Nelson Bond. Very well, then. Let's listen while Nelson Olmstead tells us about Conqueror's Isle. <laughs> As soon as Lieutenant Commander Gorham entered his room, Brady began to pour out his story. He spoke with tense, white-knuckled ferocity, his eyes intent on those of the older man. He said, you, You've got to believe me, sir. It sounds utterly impossible, I know. It, it sounds... Well, it sounds crazy. That's why I'm here. But it's the truth, and you've got to believe it. You've got to, sir. Lieutenant Commander Gorham sat down and said quietly, At ease, Lieutenant. I'm here to consult with you as a physician, not order your cure as a superior officer. Now, suppose we ignore the braid while you tell me about it. Joe Brady smiled. It was his first smile in weeks, and his face could not quite accomplish it. His lips twisted jerkily, but his eyes remained blank windows into torment. And he said, Thank you, doctor. Where would you like me to begin? Gorham shuffled the pages of the lieutenant's case history and said, Well, now let's see. It says here that you are Lieutenant J.G. Joseph Travers Brady, Navy Flyer, and you were assigned to the USS Stinger, an aircraft carrier. Is that right? Yes, sir. Well, it's your story, Brady. You know what you want me to believe. The trouble began, I understand, in your last bombing mission. That's right, sir. Or rather, that's when my troubles began. Well, the thing's been going on for longer than that, much longer. 
And someone's got to do something, Doctor. Time is racing by with every, every passing day. They grow stronger. I, I've got to make people understand. Yes, yes, Lieutenant. But suppose you start at the beginning. Now, what about that unfortunate last flight? His calm, matter-of-fact tone had a soothing effect on the younger man. Brady's voice lost its high note of hysteria, and he settled back in his chair, covering his eyes for a few moments, as if to think about this terrible story he had to tell. Well, sir, we accomplished our mission and started home to the aircraft carry, and we were cruising the South China Sea when... Well, all of a sudden, we discovered we were losing elevation like crazy. One of our winged tanks was spraying gas all over the South China Sea. We weren't worried, though. Navy watches out for its own, and we knew that an hour after we were forced to our life rafts, the rescue party would be out to pick us up. So we reported the bad news to the squadron leader, and with no great dismay, watched the rest of the flight dwindle to black dots as we lurched along, coaxing every last possible mile out of our ruptured duck. It'd be annoying, we thought and a nuisance, but it wouldn't be dangerous. That's what we thought, being logical guys. But in the South Pacific area, you can toss logic and reason right out the window. About ten minutes after the rest of the flight had disappeared, a shrieking hundred-mile gale picked us up and whirled us like a button on a hen coop door. How long we rode that thing, I haven't the faintest idea. It grabbed us and spun us as if we weighed ounces instead of tons. We had no way of climbing above the storm, of course. We just had to sit there and take it. All three of us were nerve-shattered, bone-bruised, and dog-sick from the storm's beating. And not one what would have cheerfully given up a year's shore leave to be clear of this mess. And then suddenly, as suddenly as it had sprung from nowhere, the typhoon passed. One minute we were standing in our ears in a maelstrom of wind and rain, and the next, the skies were crystal clear, and a benevolent sun beamed down on a blue, tranquil sea, while under the shadow of our wingtips lay a pink and green sanctuary of a tropical island. We came in for a landing on the beach. I wish I could tell you what island and where it was, but we'd been twisted and battered and bounced around so badly and for so long that... None of us had any idea of where we were. We might have been one mile or 50 or 500 from where the typhoon struck us. But wherever it is, we've got to find that island again. We've got to, because it's their island. Unless we find it and destroy them. Yeah. Well, I'm sorry, Doctor, but I, I feel so deeply about this thing. Well, anyway, we reached the island, which, as far as I can tell, is uncharted. A few minutes after we'd landed, we heard a cheerful hail and looked up to find a white man approaching us from a wall of tropical foliage that spanned the beach. There were several of them, and they smiling and unarmed, and they welcomed us in English with courteous enthusiasm. They had seen us land, said the head of their party, who introduced himself as Dr. Grove, and had hurried out to meet us in case anyone needed medical assistance. Well, I assured them that we were all right, and that we needed only food and rest and a means of communicating our whereabouts to our comrades, who by this time were undoubtedly fanned out over half the South Pacific searching for us. And then Dr. Grove said, Food and rest you shall have. As for the other, well, those things take time in this primitive country, but we shall see. We shall see. Well, we have a radio in our plane, I began, but Jack Cavanaugh, our radio man, shook his head at me and he said, Now, we did have, Skipper. It just went out as we sighted the island. Must have got wanged about a bit in that storm. But you can fix it? I suppose so, if it's nothing serious. I'll tell you better after I've had a chance to look it over. Of course, nodded Grove. But in the meantime, I hope you'll accept our humble hospitality. We don't have the pleasure of entertaining new guests here very often. It'd be good to chat with all of you. If you will follow me, please. Well... There was nothing else to do, like sheep being led to the slaughter. Blindly, trusting, without a struggle, we followed him off the beach into a winding jungle path. It was Jack Cavanaugh who first intimated that there might be something wrong about this setup. Even he didn't really suspect anything. He was just puzzled. 
He wondered aloud as we pushed forward. Where from? I don't get it. You, you don't get what, I asked him. That Grove character. He said they saw us land. Only where from? Where the devil do they live? In the trees? I had a good look at this island just before we landed. A good long look. I didn't see the sign of anything that looked like a house. By heaven, you're right. I didn't either. I wonder if... But my question was answered before I voiced it. We stopped before a sort of concrete shelter under a sprawling banyan tree, so perfectly camouflaged that you could hardly see it from ten yards away, much less from the air. Dr. Grove smiled and said, Here we are, gentlemen. And he touched the button, and a shelter door slid open. If you will be good enough to enter. And I said, Enter what? That? Don't be alarmed. It's merely an elevator. This entrance is from the ground level. An elevator in this jungle? Well, what kind of monkey business is this, anyhow? Do you mean to tell me you live underground? My dear lieutenant, I'll be glad to explain everything later. It's all very simple, but first I must insist that you... Oh, so now you're insisting, huh? Suppose we prefer not to step into your mysterious little parlor, then what? Well, then I should be compelled most regretfully to enforce my request. Is that right? Well, guess again, pal. I took out my automatic and held it on him, saying, this is one detail you seem to have overlooked. I overlooked no details, Lieutenant. Would you be kind enough to fire your gun? Well, I stared at him, baffled. He, he wasn't stalling. You can feel things like that. He was amused, superior. And Jack said, Watch yourself, Skipper. It's a trick. He wants you to shoot. The sound will bring help. Wrong, my friend. I need no help. And he slipped a hand into his breast pocket. Very well. And since you won't accept my invitation... Well, shooting was risky, but I had no choice. Okay, I snapped. You asked for it, and I squeezed the trigger, but nothing happened. And I don't mean that the gun missed fire or that it jammed. I mean, it just didn't go off, that's all. There wasn't a thing wrong with it mechanically. Later, I took it down piece by piece and examined it. It was perfect. But it just wouldn't fire on that island. I soon found out about that. About that and a lot of other things. Dr. Grove just looked at all of us and shrugged his shoulders. He was very calm about it all, and he said, You see, now perhaps you will be kind enough to step into the shaft. Not on your life. I don't understand what's going on here, but whatever it is, I don't want any part of it. Now, come on, gang, let's get out of here. I'm sorry. You forced me to use harsh measures. Believe me, I do so reluctantly. From his breast pocket, he drew a slender tube about the size and shape of a fountain pen, and he pointed it at me. At us, I should say, because from it suddenly flowed a silver cone of radiance. I started to rush him, but I couldn't move as that curious silvery radiance engulfed me. It wasn't a gas. It was odorless and tasteless. It didn't burn or sting or cause pain in any way. It just sort of hummed. But it was as though I had charged into an ocean of lambent cobwebs to become enmeshed in a shroud of moonbeams. I could neither move nor speak, and everything was so confused that for a while I didn't know what happened. It must have been just a short time later that I felt hands lifting, carrying me. They felt, well, how can I explain it? They, they felt far away. I could see, but only straight ahead of me. I couldn't move my eyes. And then I sensed, rather than felt, the motion of our swift descent. Dr. Grove leaned over me, thrusting himself into my line of vision, and he said, I'm sorry, Lieutenant. I sincerely regret having had to inconvenience you. But you see, firearms won't work on this island. No explosions of any kind are permitted, unless by special arrangement. We have means of hampering your primitive mechanical devices. That's why your gun didn't fire, and why your radio will not operate. I was filled with a thousand questions, but I couldn't ask them. Then the sensation of movement stopped. I heard the elevator door slide open, and our captors lifted us again, and I saw the metal ceilings of long, well-lighted corridors and heard voices proclaiming the presence of many more persons in these subterranean vaults. And then, 
Our journey continued through a maze of clean, gleaming metal corridors until finally I was carried through a doorway and placed tenderly on a cot. A light covering was thrown over me. Its pleasant warmth made me realize how weary I was. I couldn't close my eyes, but the lights were dimmed slowly. And at last, in utter darkness, I forgot my troubles in sleep. I don't know whether the return of lights awakened me or whether some unseen control automatically brought back the illumination when I awoke. At any rate, I roused from my slumber to find the room bright again. Even more important was the fact that I could move. I leaped from my cot and sprang to the door on the other side of the room, but as I had expected, it was locked. So I gave it up for the time being, any idea of attempting to escape, and I set myself to studying my surroundings. For one thing, I was alone. Apparently, our captors had assigned each of us to a separate chamber. This one was Spartan in its simplicity. Four walls of a dull, gray, metallic substance I could not immediately identify. A cot, a chair, and a desk were the only furnishings. What amazed me most was that there were no lighting fixtures. I looked in vain for any source from which originated the pleasant, unflickering illumination that flooded the room. I found nothing. The flow of light was constant, and oddly enough, there were no shadows. I think... That's when I started to get frightened. I don't mean flabby-lipped or knock-kneed scared, but cold and awed and numb, like, like, well, the way a trapped rabbit must feel. Suddenly, desperately, I needed the reassurance of my comrade's presence. I raised my voice and shouted. There was no reply. The impassive walls should have echoed the panic of my voice being metal, but like everything else in this strange place, it behaved unnaturally. It absorbed the sound sopping it up as a sponge absorbs water. I shouted again and again, and then suddenly I heard the faintest sound behind me, and I whirled. Dr. Grove was stepping through the wall. Now, you must understand me here. I said through the wall, not the door. The door was in front of me, but Dr. Grove stepped into my cell through the solid metal wall. I know you're going to say that such a thing is impossible. To us, it is. To them, nothing is impossible, nothing. Well, as I was saying, Dr. Grove stepped through the wall. And strange as it may sound, in that moment my panic ended. Oh, I still feared, yes, but I feared as a man fears a god or a demon. I looked on him with awe, knowing him to be as far above and beyond me on the life scale as I am superior to a dog or a beast of burden. So it was we talked, not as man to man, but as man to a lesser creature. And I was the lesser creature. He was the master. I was the serf. And he told me many things. Has it ever occurred to you, Doctor, that we humans are an egotistic race? Our Darwins and our Huxleys have told us that we are the product of a steady, progressive evolution, an evolution that started in primeval slime and has gradually developed to our present proud and self-proclaimed status as homo sapiens, intelligent man. But perhaps we're not so intelligent as that. There dwells upon Earth today a race representing the next step in man's progress, a people to whom our thoughts are as immature and elementary as the prattling of infants is to us. They begin where we leave off. The hard-won learning of our best brains is theirs intuitively. They sense what we must study. And what they must study, we can't even begin to grasp. They are the new lords of creation, not homo sapiens, homo superior. Now, how they came to be, that's one thing even they don't know. There's a force called mutation, which you, as a doctor, must understand better than I. By mutation, a white rose appears among the red and and the white rose beads true from that time on. The new men are mutants. They, or the first of them, were born of normal parents, but from the cradle they sensed that they were different. Having a telepathic instinct, they were able to discern their brothers in a crowd or even over long distances, and they banded together. Long ago, how long, Dr. Grove didn't tell me, the new men decided they must isolate themselves from us. It was a logical decision. They had no more in common with us than we have with our pets, our dogs and cats. So they sought this secluded island in the Pacific, far from lesser man civilization, and they went underground to escape detection. And there they live and study and learn and wait with infinite patience for the day when they must emerge and take over the world which is theirs by inheritance, even as Homo sapiens took it over from his beetle-browed forebear, the ape man. Oh, Dr. Grove explained it this way. He said, you see, we are few in number, but we increase with each passing year. Some are born here, and others come from four corners of the earth, and 
Soon, we will be many enough and strong enough to accept the responsibility of government of all the earth. You mean, destroy man and claim the entire world for yourselves? Oh, well, how little you understand us, you humans. Do you destroy the animals of the field just because they're not your intellectual peers? Our obligation is to keep and protect you, to act as your friendly guardians in a world that will be strange to you and frightening. Yes, yes, frightening. I saw the dread and horror in your eyes when I walked in. You didn't understand how I passed through a wall that to you seemed solid. In not understanding, you feared. Yet, there is nothing supernatural or fearful about what I did, about what any of us can do at will. There is no such thing as a solid in a universe wherein all things, size and dimension and substance, are but relative. We know there is room and to spare for the molecules comprising our bodies to pass unhindered through the molecules comprising these walls. We simply make a necessary mental adjustment and walk where we will. It's an ability as basic, as fundamental to us as breathing is to a person like you. Well, then, what is your plan for man? Well, your question should be, what is nature's plan for man? And I believe the question answers itself. The answer lies in history. What became of nature's earlier experiments, the giant reptiles, the anthropoids, the men who dwelt in caves and trees? Well, they died out. Civilization passed them by. They fell before the onrush of higher life forms. Even so. Even so. But uh, you have our pledge that we will be kind. So you see, that, that was the essence of the matter. These new men are intelligent, a thousandfold more intelligent than we. And being that great step farther along the path to perfection, they are born with the instinct to gentleness. That's why their weapons anesthetize but don't harm. They will not, they cannot kill. Oh, I, I could go on for hours relating what I heard and saw during the three weeks I was prisoner in the subterranean refuge of this new man. I'll tell you only a few things, because you, like the others, must think that I'm mad... But there are some things you should know. Those metal cells hold more than 200 humans like you and me, men and women who have stumbled by accident upon the hideaway island and have been restrained there lest they go back and tell the world of the conquest to come. Oh, oh, I could quote names that would amaze you. A famous author and traveler whose ship disappeared some years ago in the Pacific. Yes, a, a big game hunter supposedly killed. An aviatrix for whom a dozen fleets sought in vain. They are there. I could tell you something else that would make the small hairs creep in the back of your neck, if you dared let yourself believe it. They are here among us already, the new men. As their hour of ascendancy approaches, they are paving the way for their bloodless conquest. Some of them have left the island and have taken their places in our world. You can see the master plan. A handful of them settle in key spots. Here a, a politician, there an industrial magnate. They're an author whose every word is gospel to his readers. Now, what chance has a race of underlings to combat them when they strike? And they will strike. And soon. And when they do, that will be our end as rulers of the earth. For they can't fail in anything they try. Now, we as a people are strong, but they, they are omnipotent. Now, that's why you've got to make yourself believe me, no matter how crazy this sounds. You've got to, Doctor. From the broader point of view, perhaps it... It's better they should inherit the earth, but I'm human. I don't want to fall before a higher culture, no matter how superior. I want to live. And if we want to live, they must die. Their island must be destroyed utterly and completely. An atomic bomb could do it. Now, well, after what I've told you, I, I know you're wondering how I escaped from their island without outside help. Well... I was able to escape because I took advantage of their one weakness. They cannot willfully cause any creature pain. Knowing this, I begged Grove to take me to the surface so I could get some things from the plane. Some personal things, I told him. Pictures of my loved ones that I'd hidden in a secret compartment. And he agreed. We'd been on friendly terms for some weeks and he suspected no treachery. That is a human trait. They cannot conceive of guile or deceit. He was careless, and I was desperate. He turned to look when I cried out and pointed to something behind him. He never knew what hit him. I don't know whether my rock killed him or not. 
I hope not. Well, the plane, of course, was useless, but there were self-inflating life rafts, and the water was only yards away, and I paddled from that devil shore with the strength of a madman. Now, you know the rest, how my food and water ran out, how they found me raving in delirious days or maybe weeks later, sun-blistered and more than half dead. Dr. Gorham nodded and quietly closed the memo book in which he had scratched only doodles. Brady sat in his chair as if exhausted from the memory of his experience. Well, Lieutenant, said Dr. Gorham, it's been a pleasure listening to your story. Brady looked at Dr. Gorham for a moment and said, You, you don't believe me either, do you? Well, I'll make a report to my superiors. Please be patient and try not to worry. Good day, Lieutenant. Oh, go to the devil. Oh, go to the devil. The doctor gazed compassionately at the young man for an instant, shrugged, and left the narrow chamber. Outside, another medical officer greeted him. Ha <laughs> ha, there, Gorham. Hey, you talked with him. Well, what's your verdict? Gorham touched his forehead. A clear case of persecution mania. An amazing form. So I've never heard a tale so complete and logical, but... Well, do what you can for him. I'm afraid he's going to be here for a long time. Perhaps for as long as he lives. If turned loose, he might be dangerous. Yes. Yes, it's tough. A nice boy, too. But it does nasty things to a man floating for weeks in a life raft. He was the only one of his crew to survive... Well, Doctor, will you have lunch with me? Oh, no, thank you. I, I've got to run along. I have to turn in a report and a recommendation on this case. Of course. I'll see you later, then. The other medical disappeared down the spotless corridor of the metal ward. Gorham pondered briefly, orienting himself. He was in the west wing of the hospital, facing the street. His car stood at the curb just outside. He was very busy... There was so much work to be done, so much. And if he walked through the anteroom, some fool was sure to delay him and drag him into a long-winded discussion. He didn't feel a bit like talking. He wanted to get out of this place and forward his report that the Brady case was closed, that there would be no more trouble from that source. He glanced swiftly up and down the corridor. There was no one in sight. His senses told him the street was also deserted. There was no danger of his being seen. So, so, Dr. Gorham turned and walked quietly through the wall. can turn up the lights now. You can look around you. Nobody is there, really. Everything is all right, isn't it? Step over here, Nelson Olmstead, and tell us about next week's story. Well, next week, Ben, we have two stories. One is a classic tale of terror by W.F. Harvey called... August Heat. The other is a fantasy by Nelson S. Bond with the strange title Mr. Mergenthorker's Loblings. You have been listening to Sleep No More, an NBC Radio Network production directed by Kenneth McGregor. Mr. Armstead's albums are recorded exclusively for Vanguard Records. Until next week, when Nelson Armstead will again be here in person, this is Ben Grauer bidding you 
Good night. If you like what you're hearing on Weird Darkness, please share it with someone you know who loves the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. You can email me and follow me on social media through the Weird Darkness website. WeirdDarkness.com is also where you can find information on sponsors you heard during the show, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, get the email newsletter, find other podcasts that I host. You can visit the store for creepy and cool Weird Darkness merchandise. Plus, it's where you can find the Hope in the Darkness page if you or someone you know is struggling with depression, addiction, or thoughts of harming yourself or others. And if you have a true paranormal or creepy tale to tell of your own, you can click on Tell Your Story. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. St. Paul's Episcopal Church Cemetery in Alexandria, Virginia is home to a most peculiar grave, one that bears no name, only a haunting inscription to the memory of a female stranger. The identity of the soul at rest beneath the headstone remains a mystery, attracting visitors and inspiring ghostly tales since at least 1833. The inscription in its entirety reads as follows. To the memory of a female stranger whose mortal sufferings terminated on the 14th day of October 1816, aged 23 years and 8 months, this stone is placed here by her disconsolate husband in whose arms she sighed out her latest breath and who under God did his utmost even to soothe the cold dead ear of death. How loved, how valued once avails thee, not to whom related or by whom beget, a heap of dust alone remains of thee. Tis all thou art, and all the proud shall be. To him give all the prophets witness, that through his name whatsoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. Acts 10th chapter, 43rd verse. The poetic verses are taken from Alexander Pope's 1717 poem, Elegy to the Memory of an Unfortunate Lady, with a few alterations. The first print mention of the grave of the female stranger appears to be in a poem published in the Alexandria Gazette in 1834, which details a visit to the tomb. The poem was published under the initials S.D. and later revealed to be the work of poet Susan Rigby Dallam Morgan of Baltimore, Maryland. Miss Morgan also wrote about the grave in her column for the Philadelphia Sunday Courier under the pen name Lucy Seymour. In an entry from 1836, Morgan wrote that the stranger had been a foreign woman of tearful face and a pale complexion, who traveled with a male companion said to be her husband, though locals doubted this claim. According to Morgan, the only soul that the stranger confided in before her passing was a local pastor, whose name is also lost to time. Articles about the female stranger continued to surface throughout the years, growing more mysterious with each publication. In 1848, the Alexandria Gazette published a letter that claimed the grave belonged to a beautiful woman of pale complexion who was accompanied by a disreputable man. The companion gave his surname as Claremont and paid his bills with $1,500 in counterfeit English currency. An 1886 version, published in the Hyde Park Herald, added such dark Gothic details as a doctor sworn to secrecy and a reclusive husband who kept his wife's face hidden behind a veil and forbade anyone to speak to her or attend her funeral. An account published in the Washington Evening Star suggested that the female stranger and her male companion were doomed lovers. Yet another, penned by Colonel Fred Massey in the Cincinnati Commercial Gazette in 1887, adds that the lovers were European nobles who absconded to Alexandria and that the female stranger died in her husband's arms with their lips locked in a final kiss. The husband buried his partner in secrecy, then disappeared from town, only to return in the dead of night and exhume her body to take it with him. 
With little in the way of concrete proof, multiple theories as to the true identity of the female stranger have circulated. Some are comic in their outlandishness. One suggests that the female stranger was in fact Napoleon Bonaparte in drag, while others possess a whiff of truth. A persistent theory claims that the female stranger is actually Theodosia Burr Alston, the daughter of Vice President Aaron Burr, who disappeared at sea some four years before the recorded death of the female stranger. Whoever she was, if she existed at all, the female stranger has left a lasting impression on Alexandria. Tourists visit her grave to this day. The stranger's spirit, too, still lingers. She is said to have died in room number eight at the nearby Gasby's Tavern. Some claim that her ghost haunts the room in which she passed and can be seen standing at the window and gazing out the glass. It's where you buy your groceries and where your kids go to play. But hidden, deep beneath the ground, are centuries of secrets. Across the world, construction workers and archaeologists are digging into the soil, and they're finding pockets of bones, revealing a past that will no longer stay buried. Washington Square Park, New York what New Yorkers know today as a prime hotspot for green markets and people-watching was once a hotbed for disease-infested bodies. Originally a potter's field in 1797, the ground beneath Washington Square Park was used to bury those who died of yellow fever. In 1827, the space underwent a makeover with more than 20,000 putrefying bodies left to nourish the greenery above. 19th century lore has it that a blue mist emitted by the dead would hover over the park at night, and the park still holds secrets today. In November of 2015, city workers attempting to dig up an old water main instead unearthed a 19th century burial vault that led to yet another crypt. Mercedes-Benz Superdome, New Orleans in 1971, the construction workers broke ground in New Orleans to build the Superdome and soon found bodies and bones. Lots of them. Turns out they uncovered the remains of the Girard Street Cemetery, an old graveyard used to bury those who died of yellow fever and cholera. While the site was deconsecrated in 1957 and many of its eternal residents transported to new digs, not every body made the trip those souls not spoken for were left behind. The cemetery is technically located adjacent to the stadium under the parking lot. North Fulton Golf Course, Atlanta, Georgia Titleist enthusiasts teeing off on the fifth green at Atlanta's North Fulton Golf Course may have the hairs on the back of their necks tee off on their own thanks to the 84 unmarked graves in nearby Chastain Park. It's believed course builders knew of the graveyard's existence when they started digging back in the 1930s, which was possibly an old burial ground for a former Ames house. Why they decided to build over it remains a mystery. Either way, play through. Wekako Playground, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania You'll never look at a set of swings the same way again after learning about the macabre truth lurking beneath the Wekako Playground in Philadelphia. In use from 1810 to 1864, the Bethel Burying Ground is where close to 5,000 African Americans were left to rest in peace. Abandoned, then used as a dump, the sacred ground today is home to a child's playland as well as a full-size tennis court. Shanghai Disney Resort in Shanghai, China Disney's first foray into mainland China, Shanghai Disney, may need to update its tagline from the happiest place on earth to the creepiest. According to Mental Floss, hundreds of burial plots were unearthed during the site's construction. The tombs had to be relocated with families of the deceased receiving 300 yen for the disturbance, about $47. Lincoln Park, Chicago Now home to a jogger's favorite trail and a tourist's must-visit zoo, 
Lincoln Park in Chicago has a not-so-secret secret. There were thousands of bodies once buried below ground. Used as a graveyard for masses who died from cholera, some 80 bodies were unearthed in 1998 when construction commenced on Lincoln Park's parking garage. Though most of these bodies have since been moved, one tomb remains, the mausoleum of innkeeper Ira Couch. You can find it behind the Chicago History Museum. Crossrail's Liverpool Street Station in London During recent construction of the Crossrail's Liverpool Street Station, workers dug into a 300-year-old graveyard now believed to be the Bedlam Burial Ground, a poor man's graveyard and the resting place of more than 20,000 skeletons. The macabre discovery was nothing compared to the violent tales told by the bodies themselves. Among the strange findings, archaeologists unearthed a row of skulls, a corpse with its skull strategically placed between its legs, and a skull with a gash in its crown where a hefty blade had pierced it. Liala District, Paris, France This bustling hub lures locals and tourists alike in Old Paris, but it's actually a bright facade covering up a très somber piece of history, the Cimetière des Innocents. Used from the Middle Ages to the late 18th century, this infamous burial ground contained massive pits that could house up to 1,500 bodies. The pits remained open until they reached capacity, which made for an odor stinkier than the city's beloved cheeses, not to mention a serious threat to public health. Beginning in 1786, the bodies were exhumed and moved to the catacombs, though some of the corpses had decomposed so thoroughly that there was little left to move. According to Scientific American, the bodies that had been reduced to globs of fat were actually transformed into candles and soap. The Medicellini Across Ireland Cellini, or the unconsecrated burial grounds where unbaptized children, along with illegitimate babies and their mothers, were left to mingle in limbo, can be found scattered across Northern Ireland. The Cellini burial goes as such. No mass, no ceremony, just a male family member laying the dead child to rest, the mother not allowed to hold her child, and other members of the family discouraged to participate. Today, archaeologists and humanitarians are working to ensure these lost souls are not forgotten. Paris Catacombs, Paris, France Listed by many among the world's most haunted places, the Paris catacombs buried deep beneath the streets of Paris hold the bones of over six million French dead, interred in the empty limestone quarries from 1785 through the 1800s. With so many bones stacked up everywhere you look, it seems impossible to believe that ghosts don't exist there. Boot Hill Cemetery, Arizona The Wild West is a place awash with ghost stories, from murdered cowboys to desecrated native populations, and Tombstone, Arizona has the honor of being among the most haunted of the bunch. Several graves from the winning of the West mark the grounds, but the cemetery became famous when a photographer released a photo of what appeared to be a full-bodied ghost in the background, brandishing a knife. This has led many to flock to the area to see this phenomenon for themselves. Black Diamond Cemetery, Washington Visitors have described a lot of varying paranormal experiences, but the most common one is hearing whistling, often coming from multiple directions at once, even though no one is around you. Well, no one living, that is. El Campo Santo Cemetery, San Diego, California The now restored 1849 Roman Catholic burial ground known as El Campo Santo Cemetery, is a popular place for ghost sightings. Some of the graves here were covered over by a street, and others have been desecrated over the years, reportedly leaving the residents restless. St. Louis Cemetery No. 1, New Orleans, Louisiana When you think of famous cemeteries, New Orleans probably comes to mind. 
There are three St. Louis cemeteries in the Big Easy, but this one, number one, is said to be the most haunted. It's the oldest for sure, opening in 1789 to replace St. Peter Cemetery which burned in 1788. It's no wonder the cemetery holds some haunts, with more than 100,000 people buried in a section of land about the size of a block you'd expect that a few of them might have a little unfinished business. The tomb that tends to attract the most attention is that of Marie Laveau, the famous voodoo priestess said to be spotted not far from her grave in the cemetery. People mark three X's on her tomb, believing that doing so will cause her to grant them a wish. There's also the grave of Henry Vines, a man who died suddenly and was placed in an unmarked grave as a result. He's said to be seen as well, and there are also stories of an unnamed young man walking the grounds in solemn despair. Greenwood Cemetery, Decatur, Illinois One of the most famous haunted cemeteries in the Midwest, Greenwood Cemetery is the site of numerous ghost stories and legends. The Civil War section is the most famous, said to be haunted by the ghosts of Confederate prisoners. Hollywood Forever in California this cemetery goes back to the 19th century and is the eternal host to several famous Hollywood stars. The Psalms Mausoleum is said to be haunted by cold drafts, eerie sounds, and the ghost of Clifton Webb. The grave of Virginia Rapp is also a hotbed for cold spots as many believe her spirit seeks justice for her unsolved murder. One such ghost story, recently thrust back into the spotlight thanks to Season 5 of American Horror Story, is that of Rudolph Valentino, whose grave is said to be visited often by a mysterious apparition in black that leaves fresh roses at his vault. Camp Chase Confederate Cemetery, Columbus, Ohio Fresh flowers often mysteriously appear on the grave of a Confederate soldier who is buried here, believed to have been left behind by the famous Lady in Gray. The ghostly widow who has been seen walking among the tombstones lost her husband at the Confederate prison camp which existed on this spot during the Civil War. Howard Street Cemetery, Salem, Massachusetts Few places in the world are more rife with talk of paranormal happenings than Salem. Giles Corey famously cried out for more weight when he was pressed to death after a conviction of practicing witchcraft. Perhaps less well-known are his cries that he cursed the land of Salem before his death. Since then, Salem residents, including the famous Nathaniel Hawthorne, claim to have experienced the apparition of Corey haunting the place where he died and the cemetery. Others have mentioned the strange aura the cemetery seems to take on at night, appearing incredibly quiet for its busy location in the town. Silver Cliff Cemetery, Colorado Ghost sightings in this haunted cemetery date back to the 1880s. Ghosts of pioneers are believed to be the cause of the blue balls of light that float over the graves. Union Cemetery, Connecticut This cemetery is so haunted that famous paranormal investigators Ed and Lorraine Warren once visited to conduct an investigation into the mysterious White Lady. Several origin stories exist for this prankster spirit including the theory that she was murdered early in the 20th century or she was a wandering woman who died in childbirth. Either way, many have captured pictures of this specter and she has been known to play possum with unwitting drivers. Step Cemetery, Bloomington, Indiana A number of eerie legends and tales of paranormal activity have arisen from Step Cemetery, one of the most famous haunted cemeteries in the state of Indiana. The story is always a ghostly woman sitting watch over a gravesite, but the origins of the woman and her story seem to vary with each teller of the tale. Cemetery Hill, Gettysburg No town conjures up more images of ghosts than Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. This unsuspecting town played host to some of the fiercest fighting of the American Civil War and paid the price for it in a number of ways. One is the lingering presence of spirits in the town. Cemetery Hill was the place of a gruesome summer battle that resulted in bodies piled high awaiting burial. 
people claim to experience a phantom smell of rotting flesh sometimes in the area. Some have even seen full apparitions that have touched them or communicated with them, often warning them to leave. About a year ago, I began getting tons of notifications about how somebody was trying to log into my social media. I was getting email phishing scams on a daily basis. I was being inundated with email sales pitches from companies I'd never even heard of. I was getting calls and texts from those same companies. I was listening to a podcast that talked about Incogni, short for incognito, and I thought I'd give it a try. For the past year, Incogni has reduced the number of email and spam calls and texts that I receive, it's helped to protect my identity from hackers, and helps keep my data safe. Over the past year, Incogni has successfully removed my personal information from over 200 different data brokerage sites, and I get regular updates on how many are still in progress, how many have been successfully completed, and how many requests were sent out to remove my personal information. It would have taken me over 160 hours to do all of this, and nobody has time or patience for that. Fortunately, it's all taken care of by Incogni. I live online, personally and professionally, and I trust Incogni to help me live with a lot less worry. You can give Incogni a try right now by visiting WeirdDarkness.com slash Incogni. That's short for incognito. I-N-C-O-G-N-I. WeirdDarkness.com slash Incogni. Sons of Darkness. Lee Masters, FBI, who wages relentless war against crime. Lee Masters. The blind detective who challenges the sounds of darkness. Sounds of darkness. Tonight, the Neiman principle. You know, Lee, something's missing. Hmm? From the coffee, I mean. Yeah, I know, I know. Sam. Yep. Yeah. It doesn't taste the same somehow. Boy, will I be glad when she gets back from France. She needed a vacation, Johnny. Who doesn't? Anyway, uh, what does Russell say on that G25 report? Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, pretty routine, I guess. Nothing to get steamed up about. So? Um... Three more guys to be mother hand. Johnny, will you kindly speak English? Oh, you know, security rap, real tight. Mm -hmm. Names? One scientist, two from the military. 
names? Uh, Colonel Rutherford and Captain Long. They're from the military. Professor Neiman, University of Pennsylvania. So they're being watched, top level, big deal. Yeah, you're right, Johnny. It is a big deal. Have you ever asked yourself just why these people are tagged 24 hours a day? Well, they're important men, doing a vital job for the West. Yeah. Take this Professor Niemann, for example. Now, this man's worth would be difficult to assess. Well, let's see, Professor Avli. Biodynamics. Bio. What? <laughs> Come in. I'm Mr. Bradley. Yes. Professor Neiman. Come in, won't you? Thank you. Please sit down. Yeah. Cigarette? No, thank you. You seem a little nervous. Well, there's this terrible death of a student, Harold Peterson. And then, of course, I, I just can't seem to get used to all the security around me from you people here at the Central Intelligence. Well, you know how we feel about inconveniencing you, Professor, but I'm afraid that's how it's got to be under the circumstances. Oh, yeah. I understand. You know why I called you here, of course? Yeah? To help with the murder investigation? No, Professor. The FBI will take care of that matter. Oh. They're on the way to Pittsburgh now. What I'd really like is for you to fill me in on the developments of your experiments. Uh, just how far have you... Yeah, well, Mr. Bradley, I, I don't know if you've been following my work closely, but uh, there are many things that uh, you would not understand, not being a qualified man. All right. uh, briefly, the situation is this. For the past two years, I have been experimenting with a new synthetic food substance, which I've called glucose. It is um, superfood. It uh, is in solid form, but it can be ground into a powder, would look rather like the cereals that everyone eats for breakfast all over the world. The only difference is that glucose has the power to double a man's energy and stamina. You can see for yourself the amazing potential of such a foodstuff, especially where our armed forces are concerned. Most of this, Professor, I know already. I'm one of the very few who do, but at what stage now are your experiments? It has been decided, as you probably know, that after my successful experiments with animals, it's now time to go on to human beings, or rather a human being. The Pittsburgh Athletics Meeting. Exactly. That is our testing ground. When our Pennsylvania University meets the University of California on the athletics field, it is proposed that a measured quantity of glucose is administered to one of the athletes from Pennsylvania to observe exactly what the reaction will be. Well, it's been decided then to go ahead with the human experiment. Yeah, I'm sure it cannot be dangerous, even if it fails. I sure hope not. We don't take chances. Have you decided which athlete will be the first to take the blue cross? Yes, a young student named Bobby Nichols. He's in excellent shape. As a matter of fact, he is one of the best runners that the university has at the moment, and I think he would be an ideal subject. I see. Well, that seems to be in order. Uh, well, I suppose I must be getting back to my <laughs> kitchen, if you can call it that. Huh? <laughs> Don't worry about anything, Professor. You got the CIA and the FBI in on this. Well, here we go again. Another day, another dollar. Why Pittsburgh, though, Lee? Will you keep your eyes on the road? <laughs> How'd you know I wasn't? When you can't see, you just hear good, that's all. When you turn your head, the sound increases. Now you just keep your eyes on the road, Johnny. Huh? I'm watching, I'm watching. So? Well, apart from the killing of the student, Hal Peterson, there's been quite a storm of student unrest at Pennsylvania University over the last few weeks. At first, the authorities didn't pay much attention to it, but it seems to have gotten out of hand lately. And all over the world's the same, Lee. Just seems to be a wave of this kind of thing at the moment. Well, what's this got to do with us? Johnny, the point is that the authorities have now pinned it down to an extremely fractious element of the student community. And they feel there's a, a nucleus of students who are making it bad for the rest. And these students are communist-inspired. Communist-inspired or trained? 
Is that what we're going to find out? There's something you don't know, Johnny. Even I only found out about it this morning. Strictly top secret. You see, there's this Professor Nima. The guy whose name was on the report I read to you this morning? Yeah, this guy is a professor of biodynamics. Uh oh, here we go with that word again. Well, actually, it's, it's not that complicated. The definition, anyway. Biodynamics is a branch of biochemistry dealing with the study of vital force or energy on living organs. Now he tells me. This Professor Neiman, who's head of the Faculty of Biochemistry at Pennsylvania University, has apparently developed a synthetic foodstuff which is called plucrose. Now, this plucrose had the effect on animals of producing double the amount of stamina and energy than a normal man. So, there it is, Johnny. That's the story of Professor Neiman and his principle of dynamic energy. Uh -huh. Central intelligence have got enough on their plates keeping Professor Neiman under surveillance without the threat of a communist-inspired revolt. Now I understand. So we got to get down there to uh, keep the scene happy, huh? Something like that, Johnny. Step on it, will you? Looks like a particularly nasty killing. Although instantaneous. A double chop to the right carotid artery. Yeah, not the way we train our boys. Well, what do you think actually happened, Lee? Well, there's not much to go on. Professor Neiman's papers on the Plucrose formula left untidily on the desk. Student Hal Peterson found dead on the floor beside them. Laboratory, obviously the scene of some kind of struggle, didn't you say, Johnny? Yeah, but not much of one. Must have been over in a few seconds. Mm. Yeah, and then there's the flash bulb, cube shape, apparently from a mini camera of sorts, used. Identified as Russian manufacturer. Yeah, the lab report it definitely said, as near as can be ascertained, this flash could be of Russian origin. Okay. Now well, let's assume that whoever it was somehow entered the professor's laboratory took out the Blue Crow's papers, knowing exactly where they were kept, and then with his mini camera, started to photograph each page. But someone, probably Hal Peterson, interrupted him. Now, he didn't like that at all. So he pitched in and killed Peterson. Then he panicked and blew. End of assumption. Inside, Jobly? It has to be. Why? There's one thing worries me. Just how did the intruder enter the lab? He just unlocked the door and walked in. Mm. Well, let's examine that lock once more, shall we, Johnny? Yeah, just to your right, Lee. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just, just take a look here, Johnny. Mm. I can feel scratches on the metal. Yeah, and the lock's busted. Kind of twisted. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but the door frame isn't touched. Not splintered in any way. That figures. It was the lock he was concerned with, just picking the lock. Then why are the scratches and the metal all twisted? Well, I'm with you. If he was just picking a lock, then why the necessity to twist the metal? To make it look like forced entry. Exactly. This lock was tampered with after entry. In other words, the guy had a key, opened the door, and walked in, as you say, Johnny in order to make it look good. He tampered with the lock afterwards. Skeleton key? Uh, Johnny, the make? Uh, it's a Schwanzheiser. Five-lever action. Five-lever. <laughs> you still think it's a skeleton key, Bradley? <laughs> I guess not. Then it was a duplicate, huh? Or the original key itself. What? <laughs> Professor Neiman, I'm concerned at the moment with one particular aspect of this whole case. I would be glad to help in any way I can. Thank you. The key to your laboratory, 
Where is it now? Where it always is, on my person. May we have it uh, just for a moment? Oh, uh, certainly. Uh, yeah. I got it. Johnny, you notice anything unusual? No, just a pretty complicated pattern. Heavy, expensive to make, and definitely the original, because it has the maker's name on it. All duplicates just carry a number, no name. Yeah. No use taking fingerprints ten to one. The guy wore gloves anyway. Okay, give the key back, Johnny. There's something wrong with the key. Professor, has anyone else other than yourself access to this very important key? No one. Only myself. So, nobody ever enters that room without your presence. I'm always alone when I work in that. I understand. Well, thank you, Professor Neiman. That'll be all for now. Very well, Mr. Masters. Oh, uh, Professor, one more thing. Yeah? This, uh, Plucros, I understand that you have a guinea pig. One of your students has been training for the InterVarsity track meeting. Uh, been on the stuff for some weeks now. Is that right? Yes, it's correct, young Robert Nichols. Yeah, how's he making out? Extremely well. I, I'm sure he will impress everybody at the athletics contest. Okay, Professor Neiman, you may go now. Uh, thank you, Mr. Masters. Well, where do we go from here, Lee? Good question. Only 21,000 or so people on this campus, including staff. Okay, now, what have we got? One dead student... An obvious attempt to photograph the professor's formula. A track meeting tomorrow. And 21,000 suspects. Figure there's a link? Link? Well, yeah. Between these events and the so-called communist-inspired unrest here at the university? Could be, Johnny. So, what do we do now? Interrogate 21,000 people? No, I, uh, I think it's reasonable to start with the central characters in this burlesque. Beginning with... Bobby Nichols? Yeah, who wants it? I'm Johnny Bridges. This is Lee Masters. FBI? Right. You finished your workout? Can you take five? Sure, I'm, I'm just about through. I guess it's, uh, it's about Hal Peterson, huh? Mm. Tell me, Bobby, were you one of his buddies? We used to work out together quite often. And uh, where exactly were you last night? Me? Well, I was pretty bushed after training. Been pretty tough these last few weeks. Did a little studying up in my room, and, and I hit the sack. You didn't hear anything unusual? No sound of a fight, maybe? No. Uh-huh. Uh, Bobby, how are you feeling after being trained on the Plucro substance? Oh, great, just great. I'm going to show those babies at UCLA just what speed is. Yeah, I'm sure you will. Uh, how was it that Professor Neiman chose you to be the first human subject? Oh, I, I don't know. I, I guess I was in pretty good shape anyway. I don't mind. Kind of fun, really. No side effects. Where are you from, Bobby? Seattle, Washington. Long way from Pennsylvania. How come? Oh, well, you see, I'm studying cosmonautics and... Uh... How's that again? Huh? Oh, uh, that's the science of aerial navigation in space. You were saying, Bobby? Yeah, well, that's why I'm here at Pennsylvania University. Seattle's not so good for that sort of thing. Besides, it was, it was all full up at uh, Washington University, I mean. Uh-huh. Uh, who's in your team in the relay race tomorrow? Well, there's a guy named Maddox. He runs first, then uh, he hands over to Bennett. Bennett takes it to, well, it was going to be Hal Peterson, but now it'll be Jim O'Grady. So you're the final burst man, the fourth runner? That's right. It's got to be that way. It's the final stretch that counts. Okay, Bobby, that'll be all. You better go back to training. You want to be fit for tomorrow, remember? Yeah, thanks, Mr. Masters. You uh, want any help, you know where to come. Bye, Mr. Bridges. Ciao. Six and all, two are playing timekeepers, the rest sort of background boys. Good. 
Johnny, I want you to pay particular attention to the relay race. I want a running report on that event. But why the relay? Well, you see, I'm working on a hunch, Johnny. At the moment, it's, it's just a hunch. But I'm hoping for the best. Well, I hope you know what you're doing, Lee. I can't see the light at all at the moment. I may be wrong, but I'm pretty certain something is going to happen. And it's got to happen soon. But why, Lee? Well, for one thing, the guy who photographed that formula, he's now in possession of a very valuable microfilm. He's got to get rid of it, but fast. How? That's the question. Now, he has to pass it on. That's the way they work. Someone's the middleman. And there's a third and final contact, too. Will the competitors for the final event of the afternoon be four by 100 relay race? Please assemble at the start. Thank you. You think Bobby Nichols, even with Blue Cross, can beat Anderson in the final burst? Anderson? UCLA's final winner. Anyway, it looks like they're lining up, Lee. We'll soon find out. Ford's hanging over the back room. Now. Maddox, now. That's Grant from UCLA. Grant from UCLA, only a yard clear of Bennett for Pennsylvania. This could be anybody's race, ladies and gentlemen. But Grant hands over. Now. Bennett to O'Grady. Now. Grant has just handed over to Richards of UCLA. And the gap has widened with O'Grady for Pennsylvania about three yards behind. Now a lot is going to depend on Nichols if Pennsylvania want to take the shield. Richards is handing over to Anderson now. Here comes O'Grady. Now. Anderson's going ahead slightly in this final burst. Nichols. Nichols, he's catching Anderson. Yes. I've never seen anything like this in 20 years. It's Nichols. Nichols. Some race. Watch him, Johnny. What's he doing? Well, he's just talking to Anderson of UCLA. How close are they? Well, they're just talking to each other. What's he doing? Well, nothing, Lee. He, he, he's just handed over his baton to Anderson. At least I think so, but... Okay, Bradley. Get it going. Right. Professor Neiman? Professor Neiman? Try the door. Okay. Hey, it's open. Yeah, I'm not surprised. Let's go in. All right. Well, Johnny, what do you see? Wow, what a mess. Bottles, jars all over the place. Hey, what's that? Mm. There's been a fire here. Yeah. Papers. Burnt. The Blue Crow's formula. I don't know, Lee, but someone's... Gee. What is it, Johnny? The professor. Under the bench. Dead. I'll say. Head nearly blown off. There's a revolver in his hand. Suicide. That's what I was afraid of. Start at the beginning, shall we? Professor Niemann discovers Plucros here at Pennsylvania University. Now, this is dynamite. He knows it. We know it. And so do the Russians. Or at least they don't right off. The Russians, like the Chinese, are very thorough when they go in for subversive activity. This Bobby Nichols, to all intents and purposes, 
is a clean, good-living, all-American boy from Seattle. But in reality, he's as Russian as vodka. Trained in Russia? Not only trained, he is Russian. Brainwashed and fitted out with a new psyche, a new personality, a new background. They get him into the States with a whole history built in, even with parents for good measure. His job? To create unrest among the students of the university. Yeah, there may be a hundred other such Bobby Nichols scattered around campuses all over America. But how did he find out about Pilcross? I mean, it was supposed to be top secret. He found out the same way he got into Professor Niemann's laboratory. And that was the one thing worrying me. Now, as you know, Nichols won't talk. He just clammed up. But we can be pretty certain that Niemann not only told him about Plucros, but actually gave him the key of his room. Gee, but, but why? Scientists are a strange breed, Johnny. To them, science crosses the boundaries of mere politics. So Niemann was a double agent? Uh, not strictly, Bradley. He wasn't working for the Russians and the Americans. He let it be known among foreign embassy circles that he was interested in sharing his scientific discoveries with any country. China, too, if necessary. Yeah, the Russians soon put Nichols onto him. And they formed an alliance. Right. Now we come to the athletics meeting between Pennsylvania and California universities. If you recollect, Johnny, during my interrogation of Nichols, he made a perfectly innocuous slip. He said he was majoring in cosmonautics. Do you know the difference between astronauts and cosmonauts? Oh, yeah, Lee. We Americans call spacemen astronauts, but cosmonauts is what they're called in Russia. Yeah, precisely. Uh, I assumed Nichols was the guy we were looking for and who'd killed Peterson, but I couldn't prove it. Then at the sports meeting, I knew something had to happen, and it did. When you told me that Nichols was talking to Anderson at the end of the relay race and then handed over his baton to Anderson, that's when your boys jumped in, Bradley. Gee, what a place to hide microfilm. And how about that yet? <laughs> Anderson was the third man. Oh, he was an ideal contact living in at the University of California. Barclay near San Francisco, right on the coast. And from the coast over the seas to the Soviet Union or anywhere. Huh? Yeah. So Professor Neiman panicked when he saw what went on with the baton and shot himself. So I guess that takes care of that. Well, we've still got the microfilm, Johnny. At least Neiman left that behind. And what's more, Blue Crows works. It sure does. I think I'll get hooked on that stuff. After all, in this business, you need to be a Superman. Believe me. have been listening to The Sounds of Darkness. Join the world of Lee Masters, the blind detective, next Tuesday in The Sounds of Darkness. The Sounds of Darkness is produced by Henny van Beek. Thanks for listening. If you like what you heard, be sure to subscribe so you don't miss future episodes. If you like the show, please, share it with someone you know who loves old-time radio or the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. You can email me and follow me on social media through the Weird Darkness website. WeirdDarkness.com is also where you can listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, get the email newsletter, visit the store for creepy and cool Weird Darkness merchandise. Plus, it's where you can find the Hope in the Darkness page if you or someone you know is struggling with depression, addiction, or thoughts of harming yourself or others. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. All stories used in Weird Darkness, aside from the old-time radio shows, are purported to be true unless stated otherwise, and you can find links to the authors, stories, and sources I used in the episode description. I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me for this episode of Weird Darkness's Retro Radio.